because the school's supposed to be safe. Topping your Fox 45 early edition newscast, parents fear for their children's safety after sources confirm a seven-year-old brought a loaded gun to school. Coming up, why police are unable to question him about it. Meantime, new Baltimore police data shows the city felt a handful of juvenile violence this holiday weekend. Coming up, the new voices calling for change. A cold start to your morning, but it's going to be even colder later today. And we'll talk about how long this winter like weather sticks around. Live from WBFF in Baltimore, this is Fox 45 Early Edition. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Fox 45 Early Edition on this Tuesday, it's November 28th. I'm Megan Gillen. We need to bring meteorologist Justin Chambers in. You mentioned it was going to be cold. We are feeling that, Justin. Yeah, and it's going to be even colder tomorrow too, Meg. So especially as we head into the afternoon, it's kind of like a winter preview because the good news is a couple of days from now, it will be quite a bit warmer and more on the milder side. But right now, looking out over the Inner Harbor, not frozen over yet, not quite. Our temperatures are in the 30s, 33 in Cockeysville and Bel Air, 35 in Baltimore City, 33 in Annapolis and Columbia right now. Weather story, a cold Tuesday morning, a blustery day ahead. That wind is going to be whipping around throughout the afternoon and it's going to feel even colder than what the thermometer indicates. And then we will be warmer as we head later into the week. So you can see on your morning drive overall our temperature staying right near that freezing mark may need to do a little bit of scraping here this morning. But overall we'll have plenty of sun for the afternoon. Back with your full forecast in just a few minutes. Thank you, Justin. This morning, Fox 45 News is following two big stories surrounding the juvenile crime crisis here in Maryland. We've heard, heard about things around here like that, but I never would expect to have an, an actual elementary school around here. Like, that's a little crazy. I think this issue particularly has gotten so bad that everybody started to feel it in their, in their own communities um, that, that they're going to be on the same page largely. It's really at a boiling point for us. Well, we are learning that a child was found with a gun in his backpack last week at a Baltimore City school. Sources say the suspect is a seven year old. This combined with new data from the Baltimore Police Department shows a violent Thanksgiving weekend in the city. And now we are hearing growing calls for action from state legislators. In the past six days, Baltimore police say 15 young people have been arrested for various crimes across nearly half of the city's police districts. Police arrested seven juveniles for car theft in the Northern District on Sunday. The youngest, 12 years old. Police tell us one of the 15 year old suspects had been arrested eight times. In the Southern District on Friday, two 15 year olds and a 14 year old were arrested for holding a man at gunpoint and demanding his keys. Police arrested the teens in a stolen car, saying one of the teens had already been arrested three times on stolen car charges. Last Wednesday in the Southeast District, authorities say that four teenagers robbed a man and assaulted him at gunpoint right near Patterson Park. All four were arrested. And in the Eastern District that same day, Foxtrot tracking down two teens who stole a car. Police then recovered drugs and a stolen gun when they arrested those suspects. Still to come this morning, we have live team coverage on how Fox 45 News is demanding answers when it comes to this juvenile crime. Coming up at 5 o'clock, Taylor Stewart will be live with how we are pressing lawmakers on the state's juvenile justice laws. And Shannon Lilly will be live with why those laws could be impacting an investigation into the young person accused of having a gun in school, a story that we mentioned just a few minutes ago. Well, this incident is just the latest leading to questions about Maryland's juvenile justice laws. Earlier this month, a 12 and 14 year old were caught on camera allegedly beating a woman and trying to steal her car in Butchers Hill. They were released after a few hours following a call from DJS to Baltimore police. In Montgomery County, a 12 year old is accused of making seven school threats in a three week period in October. He allegedly told police that he knew he wouldn't face charges because of the state's laws. Juveniles are also often accused of taking part in the car theft crisis. Baltimore City has now surpassed 10,000 auto thefts this year. Police say that juveniles stole 38 percent of those cars. The Baltimore Police Department has given out more than 3,000 steering wheel locks to residents, but these auto thefts are still happening. Fox 45 News spoke with one man who had a lock on his steering wheel, but his car was still stolen for a second time over the weekend. I'm the victim, but I'm being treated like the 
the villain. I mean, these guys go around stealing these cars each and every day, tearing people's cars up, and we got to dig in our pockets for something that they done destructed. Right. It's not right. right. And the city needs to do something. BPD sent us a statement saying in part the department is working to address this surge in auto thefts and that they have seen a 21% reduction in auto thefts in the last 28 days. Baltimore police data reports 10,300 auto thefts and attempted auto thefts so far this year. Parents, police, prosecutors have all been complaining about juvenile crime for months, calling for accountability when it comes to young people. Today, the Baltimore City delegation is holding their fourth annual pre-session hearing. Everyone is welcome to speak up and share their insight on how to make improvements in Baltimore. The meeting is virtual and it will be held from 6 to 8 tonight. This meeting comes on the heels of, a, of other state delegates saying that they need to take action. State delegate Nino Mangione says that something needs to be done. As an elected official, number one priority, an obligation to push policies that result in more public safety. And there's no better message to send to potential would-be juvenile criminals than prepare to pay the price. You're no longer getting away with it. Well, that brings us to our question of the day. Do you want your elected leaders to hold young kids accountable? So far, 98% of those who have voted so far say yes. You can make your voice heard right now by going to foxbaltimore.com slash vote. Still to come this morning on Fox 45 Early Edition, a shooting in Prince George's County caught on camera. After the break, how the situation unfolded all on surveillance video. And this morning, we are cold. Actually, cold with some areas feeling temperatures below freezing. Coming up, meteorologist Justin Chambers is tracking if we could see a few snowflakes in the air today. And before we head to break, a quick look at your Lens Stoller traffic network here this morning. We've got some of our live cameras around the region pulled up here and looking pretty good out there right now. We've got light volume and in these cameras, no issues to report. Time now 437. You're watching Fox 45 Early Edition, all local, all morning.
New details this morning in Anne Arundel County with an investigation into a deadly crash that happened on Thanksgiving. Officials say 54 year old Kevin Christ was hit while crossing Ritchie Highway in Glen Burnie on Thursday by a 77 year old man. Police say Christ was wearing all black clothing and was not using a crosswalk. The incident is still under investigation. In Prince George's County, invest an investigation is underway there after a shooting in Landover was caught on camera. We want to warn you, what you're about to see is graphic. This surveillance video here shows at least five people dressed in dark clothing coming out of a parked car, then shooting at a man coming out of his house. Police say that man was shot multiple times, but he is expected to be OK. Neighbors say bullets went through the window of a home and a parked car. Police are asking anyone with information on this incident to call them. A woman in Washington, D.C. is pleading for help after she says someone stole her puppy right in front of her home. Take a look at this right here. Surveillance video shows Tiffany Worthy walking home with her dog when two black cars pull up in front of her. Worthy says a masked man then ran up the stairs, snatched her dog, and left. Said, give me your dog or I'm going to kill you. Um, looked like he had something of something black or belting in his hand. He ran off laughing like it was like, like it was nothing, you know. And, you know, and I'm pleading, you know, to, for him to give me the dog back. No remorse. The event is bringing back painful memories for Worthy, who says her puppy was a gift from her friend after her old dog was killed in a flash flood just three months ago. On Capitol Hill, history could soon be made by the criminally indicted Representative George Santos. Still to come, we take a look at his chances of being expelled from Congress versus remaining in a seat. But first, gift card season is here. As the holiday season now in full swing after the break, the high-tech scam that you need to be aware of and how to protect yourself. But first, here's what's ahead this morning on the National Desk. I'm Jan Jeffcoat. This morning on the National Desk, a growing number of Chinese migrants crossing the southern border. The former acting head of Border Protection is going to join us to discuss this morning on the National Desk, America's News Now, weekday mornings. You can watch the National Desk on our sister station, the CW Baltimore, weekdays from 6 to 9 a.m. It is 442, and you're watching Fox 45 Early Edition, all local, all morning.
In your consumer news, with the holidays in full swing, gift card season is here. Currently, there is a high-tech scam that you need to be aware of. Consumer reporter Cassie Arsenault is breaking it down, telling you how to protect yourself. Imagine buying a beautiful cashmere sweater or a diamond necklace for your loved one, getting it all wrapped at the store, and then watching them open an empty box. That's essentially what's happening with gift cards that people are buying for others. Here's what the con looks like. Now it's a high tech scam and people are hacking into companies' websites and stealing the gift card codes. So when you go to put $200 on a gift card, then give it to your loved one and they go to spend it and there's nothing on it, that's most likely what happened here. It's a challenge, but it's still a great idea to, to give someone instead of like knowing their size, right? We want to be able to give them a gift card um, instead of just cash all the time. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, one of the, the things that you can do, it's, uh, you know, use it right away. Make sure you're checking the balance. Here's how you can fight against this fraud. Do not leave gift cards in a drawer for a year. Try to use them as soon as possible. If you get a gift card as a gift, make sure you keep the receipt that comes with it. You'll need it if a problem does occur. And remember the day you activated it or tried to use the gift card. The company or store will need this information to issue a refund. Now, if the company or store does not decide to issue you a refund, there's not much recourse you can take here. These are anonymous and it's very hard to see whether you or someone else has used the gift card. Fighting fraud, I'm Cassie Arsenault. All right, Cassie, thank you. In brighter holiday news at the White House here, holiday decor in full swing. Let's take a closer look here. This year, decorations are meant to capture the magic, the wonder, and the joy of the season. First Lady Jill Biden unveiling the theme yesterday, and she says that she wants everyone who visits the White House to feel like a kid again. The decor features giant oversized candy and sweets and multiple tributes to the popular poem, Twas the Night Before Christmas. Each room is designed to capture this pure, unfiltered delight and imagination. To see, you know, the, this season, this time of year, through the wondrous, sparkling eyes of children. That's what it's all about. The display includes 98 Christmas trees, nearly 34,000 ornaments, and more than 142,000 lights. The first Christmas tree that visitors will see when entering the White House is decorated with wooden gold star ornaments engraved with the names of fallen service members. Looks nice, very colorful too. 448 here, feeling like the holidays. We've been talking about meteorologist Justin Chambers here with the numbers and I mean, people last night at lacrosse practice talking about snow flurries. Is that happening? Yeah, not really too much. I mean, okay. we have a few flakes that are kind of flying around. I'll show you that radar here in just a second. Right now, looking at our live cam over downtown Baltimore and not seeing much here at this time. Our temperature officially at BWI Thurgood Marshall talking about numbers right there at uh, 35 degrees. Westerly wind about 6 to 10 miles an hour. Wind is calm for now, but that wind is really going to pick up once we get into the afternoon. And you can actually see a few of these Flakes that are flying around Eldersburg and Columbia right now, just kind of west of Baltimore City and west of the outer loop. That's what's being picked up on our zoomed in radar. When you zoom out a little bit farther, you can actually see a few of those little light blue kind of uh, areas there. And that's picking up on that satellite and radar picture as well. Just that cold air mass that is in place. There's just not a lot of moisture. If we had just a little bit more moisture, we would definitely be talking about a different type morning here. But overall, not going to get any kind of a snow day here at home. Here's a look at our future scan. Now that wind is definitely picking up. This is later this afternoon. You're going to see that 20 and 30 mile an hour wind gusts here from the west and the northwest. And that wind's going to stay with us through most of the day into early tomorrow morning. What it's going to do with the temperatures. These are your feels like temperatures. So even though our temps get to the 30s and some low 40s later today, it's going to feel more like teens and 20s when you add in the wind and that uh, feels like number. And even tomorrow morning will be colder. Even though that wind dies down, we're going to talk about teens and single digit wind chill numbers. That gets into the dangerous category for your Wednesday morning. Here's your rise and shine cast. Definitely a warm beverage today with temperatures hanging out in the 30s for the next few hours. Sun's up at 
704 goes to bed tonight at 445 as those daylight hours continue to shrink. Typically this time of year, late November, we're in the lower 50s. Nowhere near that today. Mid to upper 30s is what we're talking about. Some of us will sneak close to about that 40 degree number right there in Baltimore City. 38 in D.C., 42 down the ocean. So no relief there for sure. All right, here's our future scan. So a lot of sunshine throughout the day today. Again, the wind will be the big issue and the cold air. Tomorrow, a lot less wind. We still are on the chilly side of things and a few clouds hanging around Wednesday afternoon. But Thursday, we change up the weather pattern. We're tapping into more of that southerly kind of warmer air that's going to be coming in. And then as we get into Friday, we're tracking our next weather maker. That's going to bring some rain showers here Friday, right about noontime. And then through the later part of Friday afternoon into the evening time, we'll see another round of rain. So that will be good to kick off the month of December on a positive note in terms of the rainfall, but maybe messing up what you're trying to do outside on Friday. All right, here's that seven day forecast. You can see those numbers 40s today and tomorrow will be in the 50s by Thursday and Friday. So it is a brief little winter preview before those numbers start to climb this weekend and get back to the mid to upper 50s as well. Now let's get a check on Mass Transit. Mark Jones with the MTA. Good morning. Well, good morning, Justin. Good morning, everyone out there on the Mark Train system. You'll find Pen Train 505 and Pen Train 403, both operating uh, with delays running about five minutes late, in fact, so allow a little extra time for travel there. Light rail right on time in both directions of flat service, and you'll find no delays on Metro Subway. For the MTA Transit Team, I'm Mark Jones. I'm Scott Thuman in Washington, where the White House continues to push electric vehicles, but at a significant cost to taxpayers. How much? We'll take a look at the numbers coming up. And former President Donald Trump expected back in court next month for his civil fraud trial. After the break, how this time differs from the last. It is 452 and you're watching Fox 45 Early Edition, a local on Making headlines this morning as we take you live to Capitol Hill. Criminally indicted Representative George Santos will make history 
If he is expelled from Congress, House lawmakers haven't expelled one of their own members in more than two decades. Overall, there have been five expulsions in the entire history of the institution. There could be a vote by tomorrow. I think you will see uh, more and more members voting for that, and it'll be a, maybe a close vote, but I, I think he will be expelled if he doesn't resign. I hope he resigns before we get to that point. Santos's fellow Republican Ethics Committee Chair Congressman Michael Guest is the one who introduced the expulsion resolution, giving it even more weight. It will be a tough vote for Republicans as they hold a slim House majority and will likely lose a special election race. Meantime, former President Donald Trump is expected to testify again next month in his civil fraud trial. It comes after a defiant first turn on the witness stand earlier this month. His defense attorneys say that he will return December 11th, and this time former President Trump is being called by his own lawyers, but he can still be cross-examined. The Republican 2024 presidential frontrunner was first called to testify by the New York Attorney General's office, a testimony during which he slammed the Attorney General and defended his wealth. Now taking you live to the White House here this morning, as officials plan to spend billions of dollars to strengthen America's supply chains, and that includes more money to help the car industry make and power electric vehicles. But some industry experts say the federal government's investment in EVs isn't paying off. Sinclair's chief political correspondent, Scott Thuman, has a closer look at why. Come on, jump in and give you a ride to Washington. President Biden has long seen himself as a champion for the electric vehicle industry and going more green when it comes to American energy. But while the ideas may be there, are the buyers. The government may be pushing electric cars, but customers aren't keeping up. As industry experts are quoted saying, there are more than 114,000 EVs currently collecting dust on car lots. According to a study by the Texas Public Policy Foundation, due to federal government aid to the industry, American taxpayers are on the hook for a staggering $50,000 for every electric vehicle sale, or $22 billion annually. And that doesn't include the $7,500 tax credit Uncle Sam is offering electric car buyers. The other huge uncertainty here is for how long will these tax credits be around? The only real way to figure out sort of if, if the math pencils out or not, it's a market test. It's fundamentally a question of do people want these things or not and at what price point. Yet a White House proposal would in theory result in half of all U.S. cars being electric or plug-in hybrids by the year 2030. In its continued fight against pollution and the fossil fuel industry, the White House on Monday announcing $275 million to go in part toward advanced energy programs, which will include producing more EV batteries. What's next? What can we do? What must we do to keep making progress? That on top of money already secured in the infrastructure law to provide $3.5 billion. The accounting from Ford is something like losing between 30 and $60,000 per EV sold. Um, that's not a sustainable practice for a for-profit company to be doing. And as automakers slow production, hampering plans to build more charging stations, Washington may have to reassess the road forward. On Capitol Hill, I'm Scott Thuman. All right, Scott, thank you. For the first time in two years, meantime, President Biden is not expected to attend the opening of COP28 this week. The two-week United Nations Climate Summit will begin in Dubai on Thursday. The White House declining to comment on Biden's travel plans, but says that the administration will have robust representation this year. So we'll have special envoy John Kerry, National Climate Advisor Ali Zaidi, and Senior Advisor John Podesta, among others. We'll continue to build on the administration historic actions to tackle uh, the climate crisis. Well, the event is expected to draw leaders and diplomats from about 200 nations and the Vatican. A child found with a gun in his backpack at a Baltimore City school coming up. The concern from parents and why police's hands may be tied. The latest crime concerns coming from lawmakers as they head into the next session. Why some say they're not on board with repealing the two laws at question. Temperatures are cold this morning, but will be even colder and will feel colder later this afternoon. We'll talk about how long this winter blast hangs around. Live from WBFF in Baltimore, this is Fox 45 Early Edition. 
Good morning on this Tuesday, November 28th. I'm Patrice Sanders. I'm Tom Rogers, and it is a cold day ahead. That's right. Meteorologist Justin Chambers here with just how cold we're talking about. Yeah, and our temperatures right now, they're not that bad. I mean, we're in the 30s as you get up and out of, uh, get up and out here this morning. We'll take a look outside right now from our Towson camera. We do have some clouds hanging around, and we do also on our radar have a few light snow flurries flying around there. This is from Eldersburg, just north of Columbia, out through Arbutus and Elk Ridge, kind of on the western edge of the Beltway. And these are going to be moving right into Baltimore City, I'd say within the next 10 to 15 minutes. Again, not anything that's going to stick, but we definitely have a little bit of moisture and enough of that colder air where we're getting just a few of those flakes that are flying right now. Statewide, we're in the 20s in Western Maryland. Pretty much all the rest of us are in the 30s for Westminster and Bel Air down through Baltimore City at 37, 32 in Bel Air, 34 in Annapolis right now. So we'll see those temperatures that will hang out in the 30s for the next couple of hours. Definitely want your heaters on as you head out here for the morning time. Coming up in a few minutes, we'll talk about how the wind is going to play into the feels like temperature this afternoon and potentially tomorrow morning where it could be in that dangerous category. Tom? Yeah, it was real windy yesterday afternoon. Well, let's take a look at your lens solar traffic network and some of the cameras around the Baltimore region wide open. No issues to report at all throughout anywhere in Baltimore. We've heard, heard about things around here like that, but I never would expect to have an, an actual elementary school around here. But that's a little crazy. I think this issue particularly has gotten so bad that everybody started to feel it in their in their own communities um, that, that they're going to be on the same page largely. It's really at a boiling point for us. This morning, Fox 45 News is following two big stories surrounding the juvenile crime crisis here in Maryland. Yeah, calls for more action from legislators are growing after new data from the Baltimore Police Department highlights a violent holiday weekend in the city. The juvenile crime concerns extend to Pigtown, where police say a majority of suspects in a recent string of robberies are juveniles. Sources also are telling us a seven-year-old was found with a gun in his backpack just last week at a Baltimore City public school. This morning, parents are concerned. This morning, we have live team coverage when it comes to demanding answers to the juvenile crime crisis. In a few minutes, Taylor Stewart will be live with how Fox 45 News is pressing lawmakers on the state's juvenile justice laws. But we begin with Shannon Lilly, and she is live from BPD headquarters with why those laws could be impacting the investigation into that 70 year old accused of having a gun. Shannon. Well, because of the child's age, Patrice, juvenile reform laws prohibit police from charging that child or even questioning that child. Now, as of this morning, Baltimore police have not yet indicated who owns the gun, but sources do confirm to us that a seven-year-old was found with it in his backpack. Police are telling us what happened, though, in a statement they released. They describe it a bit, saying a member of the school staff received an anonymous tip regarding a student possessing a weapon concealed in their backpack. The staff member proceeded to inspect the backpack and visually confirmed the presence of the weapon. This weapon was removed and officers were notified. Now, Kendra Nelson, seven year old watched as teachers discovered that weapon. He actually saw uh, the gun that the child had in class. I would say the child obviously got it from an adult. So where's the conversation being had with the adults in that child's life? Well, in a letter to parents, school administrators say the student was detained and will be addressed. They also encourage parents to talk to your child about safety and monitor what your child brings to school. But because of juvenile reform laws, retired city police officer Daryl Burham says police action is now severely limited even when guns are found in schools. It may be show and tell until somebody confronts them. And I do believe push comes to shove when it comes down to they wouldn't hesitate to shoot somebody. They have no fear. They have, there's no consequence. Well, our sources are telling us that that student is being transferred to an alternative school, but it is still unclear whether police will be pursuing the owner of the gun. Reporting live from police headquarters, I'm Shannon Lilly, Fox 45 News, Early Edition. Thank you, Shannon. And this incident is just the latest, leading to questions about Maryland's juvenile justice laws. Earlier this month, a 12 and 14 year old were caught on camera allegedly beating a woman, then trying to steal her car in Butchers Hill. They were released just hours afterwards following a call from DJS to Baltimore police.
In Montgomery County, a 12-year-old was accused of making seven school threats in a three-week period in October. He allegedly told police he knew he would not face any charges because of the state's laws. Parents, police, and prosecutors have been complaining about juvenile crime for months now, calling for accountability for young people. Today, the Baltimore City delegation is holding their fourth annual pre-session hearing. Everyone is welcome to speak up and share their insight on how to make improvements in the city. That meeting is virtual and will be held from 6 until 8 tonight. Now, the meeting comes on the heels of other state delegates voicing the need for lawmakers to take action. State Delegate Nino Mangione says something needs to be done. As an elected official, number one priority, an obligation to push policies that result in more public safety. And there's no better message to send to potential would-be juvenile criminals than prepare to pay the price. You're no longer getting away with it. Well, another lawmaker is calling for patience, saying that these juvenile crime laws have not been in place long enough to see their impact. Taylor Stewart joining us live this morning with Wyatt County State's Attorney and State Delegates say we can't afford to wait. Taylor. Uh, Tom, it really comes down to just a handful of laws. Prosecutors say they want to see change next session. At the forefront of this movement, John McCarthy, he's the Montgomery County State Attorney, and he's taking issue with the two laws we've repeatedly told our viewers about. One of them, the Child Interrogation Act, which prevents police from questioning juveniles without an attorney and a parent's permission. The other one is the, the, the act that prevents 13-year-olds and youngers from facing violent misdemeanor charges. At this point, though, it's pretty clear he doesn't have entire support from those lawmakers. In fact, Senate Del Delegate uh, Judicial Proceedings Committee lead uh, ju um, Mr. Senator Will Smith, rather, he says he's not on board the full repeal of this state of the laws at play. He says he needs more time to see the results, but we'll have to see. Take a listen. We put in place, we're going to take a couple of years uh, to fully see the kind of the fruit uh, of the foundations that we've laid and the seeds that we've planted. I, for one, am not interested in rolling back uh, the reforms that we put in place last year. We've got to look at services. We've got to look at options. We've got to look at more flexibility for probation. Now, McCarthy says he understands the idea behind the plans and agrees a full repeal isn't entirely necessary, but he says there are specific changes he'd like to see, like reviewing felonies, letting the judges have more faith, and, and putting probationary limits on for some of the juveniles at play here. <clears throat> Tom. Taylor, uh, which lawmakers representing Baltimore and the surrounding counties have spoken out about their stance on repealing or even amending current juvenile justice laws? Well, at this point, we've heard from uh, several, but Delegate Robin Smith, he's the sole Republican representing um, Baltimore County, and he says the conversations have been beneficial, but it's time to take action. Take a listen to him. People have to, frankly, stop playing so close to the chest and have uh, start having real discussions about this issue. At this point, we're still waiting to hear from the governor on his crime plan, but we will keep you posted. Reporting live in Baltimore, Taylor Stewart, Fox 25 Morning News, Early Edition. Well, that brings us to our question of the day. Do you want your elected leaders to hold young kids accountable? So far, 99% of those who voted say yes. You can make your voice heard by heading to foxbaltimore.com slash vote. And we are following two breaking stories here this morning. A wartime pause extension between Israel and, and Hamas, and also a tunnel rescue underway as we speak right now for those trapped construction workers in India. We're taking you live after the break. Temperatures in the 30s right now. Even some of us waking up to a few flakes flying around. We'll talk about how long this winter weather lasts.
511 and Israel and Hamas now agreeing to extend the war pause for an additional two days. Today, there's a possibility more hostages could be freed. Let's get right over to Megan Gillen in our live center with the negotiations that are underway right now. Megan. Yeah, guys, we want to take you live to Gaza here this morning, where so far this war pause has allowed for the release of 150 Palestinians detained for criminal offenses and the freedom of 69 Hamas held hostages, a fraction of the 240 that were kidnapped in the October 7th massacre, many who are still being held captive here in Gaza. But this morning, we know the families of the those who have been freed are reuniting, rejoicing. Take a look at this video here. This is uh, just released by the Israeli military showing the moment hostages crossed the border into Israel yesterday to freedom. After more than 50 days of being held captive by Hamas in Gaza, taking you live now to the White House where the Biden administration is still holding out hope that two more Americans will be released during this extended two-day truce. We know Hamas has agreed to release 20 people in total over the next several days. We also know today U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will visit Israel for his third trip since the start of the war. Now, also breaking here this morning, we want to take you live to India. Check this out. That tunnel rescue we've been waiting for finally underway happening as we speak. Just getting word in the last hour that rescuers have drilled through rocks and debris to reach finally those 41 construction workers that have been trapped in a collapsed tunnel in the Himalayas for the last 17 days. Again, that rescue happening as we speak. No word yet on how those construction workers are doing. We're going to keep you posted, though, right here from our live center as this situation continues to develop. Hopefully, we see them coming out of the tunnel soon. Tom? Thank you, Megan. The man convicted of killing a Little Italy restaurant owner receives his sentence. In our next half hour, what's next, including the time he's facing in prison? New data from the Baltimore Police Department highlights juvenile violence over the Thanksgiving weekend. Also, in our next half hour, the new voices calling for change. 513, you're watching Fox 45 Early Edition, all local, all more. Five sixteen, topping your consumer news. One of Gen Z's favorite fast fashion brands, 
could be going public next year. Reports say Sheen, founded in China but now based in Singapore, has privately filed to go public in the U.S. The company has reportedly hired Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Morgan Stanley to aid as the lead underwriters on the public offering. Sheen was last valued at $66 billion in May, and it could become one of the biggest IPOs in several years. Sheen's cheaply priced clothing has taken the younger generation's closets by storm. Well, Amazon is now the top delivery business in the U.S. in terms of overall parcel volume, overtaking FedEx and UPS. A Wall Street Journal of reporting internal data from Amazon shows the company delivered more packages to U.S. homes in 2022 than UPS after an eclipse in FedEx in 2020. The e-commerce giant's figures only include packages that it shipped from beginning to the end. Well, UPS and FedEx include those they hand off to the Postal Service for final delivery in their tallies. Post Office is still atop the list of buy, buy volume. If you want to keep your Google account active, you might want to sign in by the end of the week. Google accounts considered inactive will be erased in a phased approach starting Friday. Under the tech giant's updated inactive account policy released in May, those who haven't logged in for at least two years could risk deletion. The company says inactive accounts are more likely to be compromised and vulnerable to spam. Well, trending this morning, taking you to Italy's famed City of Canals as a new entry charge coming in the spring has leaders hoping to keep the city afloat. Venice will start testing a new day tripper charge and a cap on visitor access. Starting next April, the daily admission fee will cost about $5.45 for weekend peak visitors. The mayor of Venice hopes the fee will reduce crowds and improve the quality of life for their residents. Well, meanwhile, in California, November's Beaver Moon illuminates the sky. This video is from Los Angeles over the weekend, showing the November full moon shining bright. The Beaver Moon, also known as the Frost Moon, Deer Rutting Moon, Digging Moon, and more, gets its many names to signify the onset of winter and animals' preparation for the colder months. The bright Beaver Moon reached its peak illumination early yesterday morning, but it will appear full until this morning. We saw that here. Absolutely oh, yeah. beautiful for the last couple days. The I woke up. This is how, you know, that, those commercials, Dr. Rick, you know, you're becoming home, young homeowner's parents. Yes. I woke up and I'm like, who left the light on outside? That was my first, <laughs> my very first thought. Not like it's a bright moon out there. It was my, you know, my son, did he That's leave the light hilarious. on outside last night? Yeah. yeah. It looked really pretty rising in the east uh, yesterday, or last night, I should say. I had a lot of the Christmas decorations that are starting to go up in the neighborhood, and then I look yeah. out back and I see the moon rising, and I'm like, yeah, we got some cloud cover out there. You know why? Because we're getting some snow. So either way, we are waking up with some uh, flurries that are flying around right now. Not going to be a snow day, kids. Sorry, but our downtown Baltimore shot right now showing us that we have a little bit. It's kind of hard to see right here. I'll show you <coughs> Excuse me, the radar in just a second. 37, your current temperature at BWI Thurgood Marshall. Here's the HD radar that I showed you just a moment ago. And again, it's not much, just a little bit of that white stuff that is right there around Columbia and 70 that is moving across the western edge of the Beltway out toward Woodlawn and right down through Baltimore City right now, just north of Brooklyn Park. Just this little line of some light shower activity. Probably not enough to really stick. Our temperatures are just above the freezing mark. It's some of that moisture that's kind of hanging out in this cold air that is moving in behind that cold front that we saw move through yesterday, and that's what that cold air is doing. It's settling in place, but you can see a few of those light showers as well to the west of us as we go through the morning. Here's a look at our future scan. The wind will be the big issue today. We're really going to see that wind start to pick up, especially as we get to the afternoon and even into the evening time, so it'll be a blustery day. The feels like temperatures are going to be in the 20s and teens. That is what it's going to feel like this afternoon, so you have to prepare for that, especially tomorrow morning, even with just a little bit of light wind in the morning on Wednesday, we'll have colder temperatures. So we're talking about teens and single digit wind chill values, especially in Westminster up toward Frederick into Cockeysville at about 14 degrees. That's what it'll feel like tomorrow morning when you get up and when you get the kids up as well. Speaking of getting the kids to school this morning, beep, beep, we gotta get them all bundled up and ready to go. Our temperatures hang in the 30s for the next couple of hours. Upper 30s by about noontime and barely to about 40 for the afternoon. Gonna have to hang on to your hats because that, talking about that wind that will be with us throughout the day today and 
Temperature wise, not much of an improvement. We're talking about mid to upper 30s across Carroll and Baltimore counties. This is going to be our coldest temperature day that we've seen since February and definitely the coldest of the season so far. Mid to upper 30s across Howard and Arundel counties as well. Those are going to be your high temperatures. Typically lower 50s is where we are this time of year and 30s and 40s continue up and down the 95 corridor. So that cold air in place for a lot of us. Here's a seven day forecast. We'll get to 42 tomorrow, less wind and then Thursday and Friday, and those numbers jump right back to the mid 50s, even mid to upper 50s as we approach the weekend. So this is just a brief little winter preview for you with those numbers that will come back up, even though we're tracking some rain on Friday as well. All right, let's get an update on Mass Transit now. Mark Jones with the MTA. Good morning, Mark. Well, good morning, Justin. Good morning, everyone. On the Mark Train system, we've got 10 train 505 and Camden train 841 operating 5 to 10. Well, that's late. The other trains look good for travel. Light rail on time. No delays there. And Metro Subway looking good in both directions of that service for the start. For the MTA Transit team, I'm Mark Jones. Thank you, Mark. Still to come this morning on Fox 25's early edition of shooting in PG County, it's caught on camera. After the break, how the situation unfolded. A judge sentenced a man in the death of a popular little Italy restaurant owner. We'll tell you just ahead what he's, how long he'll be sending behind bars. Back to you. Five twenty-five. We have some new details this morning. In Prince George's County, an investigation is underway after a shooting in Landover. It was all caught on camera. We want to give you a warning. The video you're about to see may be disturbing. The surveillance video shows at least five people dressed in dark clothing coming out of a parked car, then shooting at a man coming out of his house. Police say that man was shot multiple times. He is expected to be okay. Neighbors say bullets went through a window of a home and a parked car. Police are asking anyone with information on this incident to contact them. 
A woman in Washington, D.C. is pleading for help after she says someone stole her puppy right in front of her home. Now take a look at this surveillance video showing uh, Tiffany Worthy coming home from war walking her dog when two black cars pull up right in front of her. You see them right there. And Worthy says a masked man then ran up the stairs, snatched her dog and left. Said, give me your dog or I'm going to kill you. Um, looked like he had something of something black or belting in his hand. He ran off laughing like it was like, like it was nothing, you know, and, you know, and I'm pleading, you know, to, for him to give me the dog back. No remorse. The event is bringing back painful memories for Worthy, who says her puppy was a gift from a friend after her old dog was killed in a flash flood just three months ago. Well, we are cold this morning with the wind moving in a little bit later on this afternoon. Coming up, if we will see temperatures reach, get out of the 30s at all today. New police data shows us more than a dozen juveniles have been arrested in the last week here in the city. Coming up, we're going to take a look at some of those cases, plus the concerning data about just how many times some of these kids have already been arrested. You're watching Fox 45 News Early Edition. Live from WBFF in Baltimore, this is Fox 45 Early Edition. Welcome back on this Tuesday morning, 5.30 is the time. I'm Patrice Sanders. I'm Tom Rogers. Freezing and breezy. A freezy day. Freezing day, right? Not a, not a good day. It's going to be cold out there. Meteorologist Justin Chambers here with the forecast, but I like the word freezy. Yeah, I think that's good. We can maybe... I think you could market that, Tom. I think we can, you know, put Print a little some t-shirts. Trademark. Yeah, why not? Freezy. Uh, we are talking about temperatures that are cold this morning. We have a really cool shot here, kind of zoomed in toward the top of the buildings. You can already see just that light wind out there, and it is blowing around some of that cloud cover and some of those flakes that are flying. I stepped outside here in the uh, Fox 45 studios. I counted nine. 
but you know, that's all right. Uh, not much. You can see this system is uh, really not bringing a lot. We've got a very dry air in place. So even those flakes that are flying for you this morning aren't going to be much of anything. Our right, temps are in the mid to upper 30s right now. 34 Owens Mills, 33 Cockeysville, 35 in Rosedale. And we're at 37 in Baltimore City. So we're going to stay on the colder side here this morning. Later in the afternoon, that's when the wind is really going to pick up. And we'll only get to about 40 today at BWI, 42 tomorrow, but right back to the 50s on Thursday. So this is a very short-lived winter preview for you. Back with your full forecast in just a few. How are we doing on the roads, Tom? Any issues out there? No, actually, the roads look great. Taking a look at your Lens Solar Traffic Network, and you can see some of the cameras around the region. Uh, no issues to report at all. In fact, uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge, bottom right there. You see the cameras wiggling a little bit because of the breeze. 531 and new data released from the Baltimore Police Department shows 15 young people have been arrested for various crimes in just the past five days and across nearly half of the city's police districts. Police arrested seven juveniles for car theft in the Northern District on Sunday. The youngest just 12 years old. Police say one of the 15 year old suspects had been arrested eight times in the Southern District on Friday. Two 15 year olds and a 14 year old were arrested for holding a man at gunpoint and demanding his keys. That is according to the Baltimore Police Department. Officers arrested the teens in a stolen car, saying one of those teens had already been arrested three times on stolen car charges. Well, Baltimore's police department is telling us that four teens robbed a man and assaulted him at gunpoint right near Patterson Park last Wednesday in the Southeast District. All four were arrested. And in the Eastern District, that same day, Foxtrot tracked down two teens who had stole a vehicle. Police say they then recovered drugs and a stolen gun when they arrested those suspects. Shannon Lilly is joining us live from Baltimore's police headquarters this morning with a look at more recent examples of juveniles accused of committing crimes. Shannon. Yeah, so this morning, Tom, we're taking a look at some of the latest police data showing that 15 juveniles have been arrested since Wednesday for various crimes. And for many of these juveniles, this is not the first or even their second arrest. The victim is claiming that the four juveniles, um, high schoolers, dressing all black, uh, went towards the park. They utilized a handgun. You're listening to Dispatch on the eve of Thanksgiving as police were called to Baltimore's Patterson Park after a victim says they were robbed at gunpoint by a group of juveniles. Just days later, a rash of armed robberies hit the pickdown area. The majority of those suspects, we're told, were also juveniles. If BPD says, well, we're arresting them, and you see that, you know, on the report that, you know, that they're, or at least they were in custody and they were taken downtown, so you know that. Uh, DJS says that you know we're giving them services and look at our chart and here's how great this is working but yet down here you know there's a lot of instances with our own eyes with our cameras with whatever you know we use whatever evidence it seems like there are kids slipping through those cracks well, there have been more than 10,000 car thefts reported in Baltimore so far this year. Last week, BPD revealed about 38% of these thefts were committed by juveniles. The breakdown even more concerning, with about two-thirds of those suspects reported to the Department of Juvenile Services and only 5% serving, in, serving any time in a DJS facility. Now, in one of the most recent cases that we're learning about from Baltimore police, they say they took seven juveniles into custody for auto theft. One of those juveniles had already been arrested eight times prior. Reporting live from police headquarters, I'm Shannon Lilly, Fox 45 News, early edition. Remembering a global humanitarian and former first lady. We'll take this off right here and Talk about the life and the legacy as we take you live to Atlanta here this morning for former First Lady Rosalind Carter. This morning, we are cold in some areas, feeling temperatures below freezing. Coming up, if we can see a few snowflakes floating around today.
538 this morning in a city in crisis nearly two years after a popular Little Italy restaurant manager Chesley Patterson was shot dead. The man who admitted to murdering him receives his sentence. Taylor Stewart joins us live with more on what Samuel Wise is now facing Taylor. That's right. The judge sentenced Wise to 50 years behind bars with probation at that. Now, back in January of 2022, this is when this all went down. Take a look. Just a few blocks away from the restaurant where Patterson was shot, he was working there. And when police say a robbery spree occurred and Patterson jumped out and rather Wise jumped out of the car. Surveillance video at the corner of the store of Eastern Avenue shows it on video and you can see in it that Patterson's walking from his car. He then later returns to his vehicle. A van pulls up. That's when prosecutors say it was Wise who jumped out of that vehicle, came up to Patterson and struggled with him before he shot him in the chest. It was someone that uh, everyone liked and uh, it was sad to hear of the situation. He pleaded guilty. That's great. I'm happy to hear that because he has to pay for what he has done. Now, this latest development in this case comes as Patterson's loved ones approach the second anniversary of his death. Hopefully, it brings closure to his family and restaurant owners and community members here in Little Italy. We're in Baltimore. Taylor Stewart, Fox 25, Early Edition. 539 now two days of funerals are about to begin in Georgia honoring the life and legacy of former First Lady Rosalind Carter and Megan Gillen is in our live center now with the arrangements that are underway Megan yeah we are taking you live to Atlanta here this morning guys this is where the first funeral will begin here this afternoon and despite being in hospice care since February Former President Jimmy Carter is expected to attend those services. We are also expecting President Biden and First Lady Jill Biden, longtime friends of the Carters, to be in attendance today, along with Vice President Kamala Harris and all of the living former First Ladies. Those tributes starting yesterday, we saw hundreds turning out to salute Rosalind Carter for her final journey from Plains to the Jimmy Carter Presidential Center. Her private burial that is set for tomorrow in the Carter's hometown of Plains, Georgia. She will be remembered for her fierce determination to help people, especially American caregivers, and for her advocacy for better mental health treatment Rosalind Carter was 96 years old when she passed away last week. Also breaking right now, we are following this closely. We want to take you back out live to India. We've been watching the tunnel rescue that's underway as we speak. We did get word a little over an hour ago that rescuers were able to drill through the rocks and debris to reach those 41 construction workers, guys, that have been trapped in the collapsed tunnel in the Himalayas there for the last 17 days. Again, this is happening right now. We've seen a lot of action, a lot of movement out there as they've finally reached them. We haven't seen any sign of them coming out of the tunnel or gotten any word on how they're doing. We're going to keep you posted as this situation continues to develop live in India. Patrice. All right, Megan, thank you. Increased Christmas tree prices are now being felt beyond just consumers. After the break, how farmers across the country are feeling the impacts. And on Capitol Hill, history could be made soon by criminally indicted Representative George Santos. Still to come, we have a look at his chances of being expelled from Congress versus remaining in a seat. 541, you're watching Fox 45's early edition all local all morning. Fox 45 News, winner of 16 2022 Regional Emmy Awards, more than all other Baltimore news stations combined.
5.44. This holiday season is here, and prices for real Christmas trees are growing. But buyers aren't the only ones hurting from the increase. I do think that we could hurt our industry by, by making such ridiculous prices that it isn't still a good value. <clears throat> A survey from the Real Christmas Tree Board found about half the farmers surveyed expect to raise prices less than 5% this holiday. Experts say that although the supply of Christmas trees is in good shape in many parts of the country, the demand is high, forcing costs to rise. An increase in holiday trees has been a trend starting during the COVID-19 pandemic. What well, is the season for giving? And for the seventh year in a row, giving vending machines is making it even easier for you to take part. This year, there will be 61 locations for the vending machines all across the world, including 41 cities here in the U.S. The tradition allows passerbys to make a purchase supporting a stranger from around the globe. You see it right there. The items in the vending machines range anywhere from five to $3,500. They include items like chickens, goats, blankets, hygiene kits, meals, vaccines, and a whole lot more. The machines will remain open until December 31st. Meanwhile, at the White House, their holiday decor is in full swing. This year, decorations are meant to capture the magic, wonder, and joy of the season. First Lady Jill Biden unveiled the theme yesterday. She says she wants everyone who visits the White House to feel like a kid again. The decor features giant oversized candy and sweets, multiple tributes to a popular poem, Twas the Night Before Christmas. Each room is designed to capture this pure, unfiltered delight and imagination. To see you know, the, this season, this time of year, through the wondrous, sparkling eyes of children. Now, the display includes 98 Christmas trees, nearly 34,000 ornaments, and more than 142,000 lights. First Christmas tree visitors will see when entering the White House is decorated with wooden gold star ornaments engraved with the names of fallen service members. We want to see how you are celebrating this holiday season. Scan the QR code on your screen and that will take you to Fox Baltimore slash chime in. There you can upload your pictures and your videos. It's powered by Stackla. All right, well, speaking of Christmas trees, look at this one. Our Fox 45 Christmas tree. It is feeling a lot like Christmas in our studio. And we have lots of gifts still up for grabs. We've got a lottery tree, tickets to see Ms. Doubtfire at the Hippodrome. That's going to be awesome. And we've got tons, tons of toys. So stick around. We're going to tell you when to call. You know, if you're just listening to us, which a lot of us do in the morning, a lot of you listen to us and you're not paying attention, right. you hear chickens and goats in a vending machine. Right. So I like looked up and I was like, wait, what are you talking about? I had to go back in the script. I understand it now. It's a giving thing for other people. Yeah. Yes. So you don't actually ship a chicken or a goat. <laughs> oh, they're not in the machine. No, they don't drop Because that out. would be a very large machine, <laughs> yeah. I would yeah. think. So. And right. messy. And messy too. Yeah, noisy. exactly right. Very noisy. Yes, for sure. Eh. All right, our Towson Cam, good morning to you. Happy holidays, everybody. Yeah, this is Giving Tuesday. Uh, it's National French Toast Day, by the way. So all I think of is 40 year old virgin with uh, Leslie Mann and Steve Carell on the car. French toast. That's what she wants, right? All right, so here we go. Uh, looking at, we got some cloud cover hanging around right now. Also, a few flakes that are kind of trying to fly around right now. 37 year temperature in Towson. That wind is out there, southwest about 8 to 10 miles an hour. Hour. This is that HD radar that I was talking about where you can see a little bit of that white stuff heading across Essex and out toward the eastern shore right across the Chesapeake. As I zoomed in a little bit closer, you can see a few of those showers, just a very few light flakes that were flying around Baltimore City. And as you look back toward the west, we are seeing a little bit more of that uh, snow, especially in the mountain locations where we've seen some pretty decent amounts here, at least in the overnight hours, and still a lot of that cold air is in place. There's just not a lot of moisture. We're pretty dry at the surface. There's enough moisture moisture hanging around for us to see just a few of those flakes that are flying right now. All right, so here's our future scan in terms of the wind. The wind really going to pick up as we get into the afternoon. Some 20 to 30 mile an hour gusts will be possible, mainly from the west and northwest. This is behind the cold front or as the cold front passes through. And then tomorrow we still have to deal with a little bit of wind, but not nearly as much as today. And then this is the feels like temperature. So check your wind chill numbers this afternoon. 
We're going to feel like teens and 20s. That is what you have to pay attention to, not only for you, but for the kids as well. Pets, plants, pipes. We always talk about the four Ps and people as well, because tomorrow morning we'll be talking about single digit wind chill numbers and teens as well. So that's something we have to think about. About The good news is this is not going to be lasting long. We're not deep into winter already. We're just kind of scratching the surface and it's a little bit of a preview. Temperatures hanging out in the 30s for the next few hours on your rise and shine cast. And overall, our highs today will only get to the mid to upper 30s, right near 40 at Baltimore City. Upper 30s for you, Annapolis and Stevensville out toward Chestertown on the eastern shore. That cold air extends all the way up into the upper Midwest as well. So overall, we're looking at uh, some dry conditions for the next couple of days. What we'll see as we go forward here with those temperatures, we're still going to be cold tomorrow, but notice those numbers eventually come up. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we'll see some 50s return and even some mid to upper 50s as we head toward the weekend. We're also tracking our next weather maker. That's going to be the rain that's coming in on Friday afternoon. So just be aware of that. But again, once we get through today and tomorrow, we'll have those numbers that will be moderating quite a bit. Tom? All right, well, let's take a look now at your Lynn Solar Traffic Network. And as Justin was talking, you may see a flurry or two around here as you're looking at some of the uh, cameras around the Baltimore region. No issues to report. But if you're traveling out west and you're growing along anywhere in 68, you get to Frostburg, it's actively snowing there. And it is shut down in certain areas because of so much snowfall on the roads here. So 68, both directions, extremely slow. Kaiser's Ridge, man, it's like barely moving at all there. Now we want to get a check of your mass transit. We have Mark Jones in the MTA. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, everyone out there on the Mark Train system. We've got Penn Train 511 at Camden 843, operating with five out of delays. The other trains of Mark look good for travel. Out there on Light Rail Lake, you'll find on-time service for your commute start. Metro Subway looking good as well between Owings Mills and Hopkins Station for travel. For the MTA Transit Team, I'm Mark Jones. Thank you, Mark. I'm Kayla Gaskins in Washington. Coming up, we take a look at the problem some congressional Republicans have with the White House's proposal to send more money to secure the southern border. Is the school supposed to be safe? Topping your Fox 45 early edition newscast, parents fear for their children's safety after sources confirm a seven-year-old brought a loaded gun to a school. Why police are unable to question him about it. 551, you're watching Fox 45's early edition. We're all local all morning.
554 and lawmakers are back in Washington, D.C. this week facing mounting pressure to address the Biden administration's spending requests for the Middle East and southern border. National correspondent Kayla Gaskins has details on the request and why there's pushback. There's a snag holding up GOP support for the White House's latest spending proposal. I think it'd be very difficult to get it done by the end of the year. House Republicans like Mike Turner say money alone won't address the crisis at the southern border. Congress is going to require that there be laws changed to to make certain that the border returns to its prior state, you know, perhaps remain in Mexico, other types of provisions that would secure the southern border. As illegal migration at the U.S. southern border continues to surge, former President Donald Trump promising a dramatic tightening of the United States' immigration policies should he win back the White House next year. I don't think there's ever been a country in history that's had a border where millions and millions and millions of people are flowing into our country. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. Another illegal migration crisis unfolding in Europe, where there's increased smuggling activity and a surge of asylum seekers from war-torn areas such as Ukraine, the Middle East, and Africa. This prompting at least 10 EU countries, including Germany, Italy, France, and Sweden, to impose checks and increased security at normally open borders. These immigration issues leading to the shocking election of far-right Gert Wilders as the new prime minister of the Netherlands. <laughs> Wilders ran on a highly controversial proposal to bring immigration to zero. <laughs> Several European countries are realizing the consequences of having open borders for, for so many years. Self-preservation is a strong human response, and that's what we're seeing. Support for tightening the southern border is on the rise in the U.S. Polling from the summer shows Americans who believe immigration is good for the country is at the lowest level in a decade. A separate NBC News poll from last week found three in four Americans support Congress spending more money on securing the southern border. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins. 56 now. Criminally indicted Congressman George Santos will make history if he is expelled from Congress. House lawmakers have not expelled one of their members in more than two decades. Overall, there have only been five expulsions in the entire history of the institution. There could be a vote tomorrow. And so far, Republicans do not seem eager to save him. I think you will see uh, more and more members voting for that. And it'll be a, maybe a close vote. But I, I think he will be expelled if he doesn't resign. I hope he resigns before we get to that point. Yeah, Santos fellow Republican Congressman Michael Guest, the Ethics Committee chair, he's the one who introduced the expulsion resolution and given it even more weight. It will be a tough vote for Republicans as they hold a slim House majority and will likely lose a special election race. 557. Maryland lawmakers are weeks away from reconvening for the General Assembly, and come January, they'll be facing pressure to scale back landmark legislation that brought massive increases to education spending. The legislation, best known as Kerwin, pumps billions of dollars into public education, but county executives across the state say it's crushing their budgets. When state lawmakers passed Kerwin in 2021, they failed to pass a funding mechanism. And now several county executives, including Bob Cassidy from Harford County, are asking the governor, state uh, Senate president, and Speaker of the House to revisit the legislation. I think I speak for all of our county executives in saying that, that our people can't, can't deal with the financial impact that the, the Kerwin, as it stands, is placed upon our taxpayers and our citizens. So we've got to make adjustments. Still ahead in our 7 o'clock hour, three main concerns that county leaders want the state to address and what leadership in Annapolis has already said when it comes to making changes to Kerwin. And we're following mounting calls for change to juvenile justice reform. Who's at the forefront and why not everyone is on board? That's just ahead. You're watching Fox 35 Morning News, all local, all morning. We are following two breaking stories. A war pause extension between Israel and Hamas there in Gaza. And also a tunnel rescue underway as we speak for those trapped construction workers in India. We're taking you live to both of those spots. Our temperatures are cold this morning. The wind is going to kick up and we are going to feel very cold for the afternoon. We'll talk about how long this winter preview hangs around. Live from WBFF in Baltimore, this is Fox 45 Morning News. 
Good morning on this Tuesday, November 28th. I'm Patrice Sanders. And I'm Tom Rogers. And right now, 68, Highway 68, western part of the state. We can take our smart um, screen right there. We'll be able to see it. Look at that. Yeah, snow cover out there. And this is uh, the western side of the state. And a little bit, we're seeing a little bit of the flurries now travel this way. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. We've got meteorologist Justin Chambers here with a look at the forecast. It's snowing so hard it's buffering on that uh, on that feed right there. But yeah, definitely out in Frostburg, uh, Kaiser's Ridge, seeing some of that, especially as you go in western Maryland, getting some good snowfall there. Yeah, we had a few flakes that were kind of flying around here and that wind is already kicking up. You can see that with this flag shot here from the top of our building, the Toyota Inner Harbor Sky Cam. Just a few flakes that were kind of flying around. Right now, temperatures are in the mid to upper 30s. Rosedale and Dundalk right about 34, 36 there respectively. 36 as well in Brooklyn Park, 35 your temp in Glen Burnie and Pasadena. So it is going to be a chilly commute with your morning drive. It's temperature staying in the 30s for the next couple of hours. Once we get to later this afternoon, that's when the wind is really going to kick up and we'll be talking about wind chills in the teens and 20s back with your full forecast coming up in just a few all right taking a look now at our lynn stoller traffic network and uh taking a look at the traffic map the beltway mostly green there are no incidents to report at this time this morning, we are continuing our coverage surrounding the juvenile crime crisis here in Maryland. Yeah, it calls for more action from legislators growing after new data from Baltimore Police Department highlights a violent holiday weekend in the city. I think this issue particularly has gotten so bad that everybody started to feel it in their, in their own communities um, that, that they're going to be on the same page largely. It's really at a boiling point for us. Somebody needs to take the charge for this. You know, these kids need to be held accountable because they don't adult things. Concerns extend to Pigtown, where police say a majority of suspects in a recent string of robberies are juveniles. Sources also tell us a seven year old was found with a gun in his backpack last week at a Baltimore school. And this morning, parents are concerned. Also this morning, we have team coverage, live team coverage this morning on how Fox 45 News is demanding answers when it comes to juvenile crime. In just a few minutes, Taylor Stewart will be live with more on the pressure to change the state's juvenile justice laws. We begin with Shannon Lilly. She's live from Baltimore's police headquarters this morning with why those laws could be impacting the investigation into the seven-year-old accused of having a gun at school. Shannon. Well, because of the child's age, Tom, juvenile reform laws prohibit officers from charging the child or even questioning the child. Now, as of this morning, police have not yet indicated who owns the gun, but sources do confirm to us that a seven-year-old was found with it in his backpack. Now, this was all unfolding at the Creative City Charter School in Park Heights. In a statement, police describe what happened, writing, quote, a member of the school staff received an anonymous tip or Regarding a student possessing a weapon concealed in their backpack, the staff member proceeded to inspect the backpack and visually confirm the presence of the weapon. This weapon was removed and officers were notified. Now, we also heard from parent Kendra Nelson. She says her seven year old watched as teachers discovered that weapon. He actually saw uh, the gun that the child had in class. I would say the child obviously got it from an adult. So where's the conversation being had with the adults in that child's life? In a letter to parents, school administrators say the student was detained and will be addressed. They also encourage parents to talk to your child about safety and monitor what your child brings to school. But because of juvenile reform laws, retired city police officer Daryl Burham says police action is now severely limited even when guns are found in schools. It may be show and tell until somebody confronts them. And I do believe push comes to shove when it comes down to they wouldn't hesitate to shoot somebody. They have no fear. They have there's no consequence. Now, our sources are telling us that that student is being transferred to an alternative school. As for police, it is unclear whether or not they plan to pursue the owner of the gun. Reporting live from police headquarters, I'm Shannon Lilly, Fox 45 Morning News. 
This incident is just the latest leading to questions about Maryland's juvenile justice laws. Earlier this month, a 12 and 14 year old were caught on camera allegedly beating a woman and then trying to steal her car keys. This was in Butchers Hill. They were released a few hours uh, after this following a call from DJS to Baltimore police. In Montgomery County, a 12 year old was accused of making seven school threats in a three week period in October. He allegedly told police he knew he wouldn't face charges because of the state's law. Parents, police, prosecutors have been complaining about juvenile crime for months now, calling for accountability for young people. Today, the Baltimore City delegation is holding their fourth annual pre-session hearing. Everyone is welcome to speak up and share their insight on how to make improvements within the city. The meeting is virtual and will be held from 6 to 8 tonight. This meeting comes on the heels of other state delegates voicing their need for lawmakers to take action. State delegate Nino Mangione says that something needs to be done. As an elected official, number one priority, an obligation to push policies that result in more public safety. And there's no better message to send to potential would-be juvenile criminals than prepare to pay the price. You're no longer getting away with it. Another lawmaker is calling for patience, saying these juvenile crime laws haven't been in place long enough to see their impact. Taylor Stewart joins us live with why a county state's attorney and state delegates say we can't afford to wait. Taylor. It really comes down to just a handful of laws here affecting juvenile justice reform that we've seen prosecutors across our state call for change for months. Well, at the forefront of that movement, John McCarthy, he's the Montgomery County State Attorney, and he's taking issue with those two laws that have been at the center of this crime debate. One that prohibits 13 year old children and younger from facing violent misdemeanor charges. The other requires an attorney be present during the questioning of a juvenile by law enforcement. However, Senator Will Smith, who's the chair of the powerful Senate Judicial Proceedings Committee, last week indicating he's not on board with the full repeal. He says juvenile justice laws need some more time to see the results. We put it in place, we're going to take a couple of years. Uh, to fully see the kind of the fruit uh, of the foundations that we've laid and the seeds that we've planted. I, for one, am not interested in rolling back uh, the reforms that we put in place last year. We've got to look at services. We've got to look at options. We've got to look at more flexibility for probation. Well, McCarthy says he does understand the idea behind the plan and agrees a full repeal might not be necessary, but he says there needs to be specific changes like reviewing all felonies, addressing some of the probationary limits and giving some faith back to the judges. Now, the House Judiciary Committee, as we mentioned before, that meeting is scheduled for next Tuesday. So, Taylor, which lawmakers in Baltimore or the surrounding counties are speaking out about their stance on repealing or amending these laws? Uh, several have spoken out recently, Patrice. Uh, most recently, Delegate Robin Grammer. He's a Republican from Baltimore County who's been working on these reforms. Take a listen to what he says needs to happen. People have to, frankly, stop playing so close to the chest and have uh, start having real discussions about this issue. <laughs> Now, he says the last, the previous hearings have been beneficial to really hammer out some of these uh, discrepancies, but we'll have to see how this all comes forward once this next legislative session gets underway. We'll keep you updated here. We're live in Baltimore. I'm Taylor Stewart, Fox 45 News. Well, this brings us to our question of the day. Do you want your elected leaders to hold young children accountable? So far, 99% of those who have voted responded yes. You can make your voice heard right now by going to foxbaltimore.com slash vote. That's great. I'm happy to hear that because he has to pay for what he has done. The man who admitted to murdering a popular Little Italy restaurant manager receives his sentence nearly two years after the shooting. How many years he could serve in prison? Our temperatures statewide cold 20s in Western Maryland where we're seeing snow showers and 30s for most of us as you wake up on your Tuesday. We'll talk about just how windy it gets this afternoon and how that's going to impact what you do outside.
6-11 on this Tuesday morning, Israel and Hamas now agreeing to extend the war pause for an additional two days. Today, there's a possibility more hostages could be freed. Let's get over to Megan Gillen in our live center with the negotiations that are underway right now. Megan. It could be big, guys. Taking you live to Gaza here this morning, where so far this war pause has allowed for the release of 150 Palestinians detained for criminal offenses and also the freedom of 69 Hamas-held hostages. A fraction of the 240 that were kidnapped in the October 7th massacre, many who are still being held captive here in Gaza. But this morning, families of those freed are reuniting. They are rejoicing. We've got some video we want to show you just released by the Israeli military showing the moment those hostages crossed the border into Israel yesterday and into freedom after more than 50 days of being held captive by Hamas in Gaza. Taking you live now to the White House where the Biden administration still holding out hope that two more Americans will be released during this extended two day truce. We know Hamas has agreed to release 20 people in total over the next several days. We also know today U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will be visiting Israel for his third trip since the start of the war here. I want to take you live now to India. This is the other big story that we've been following here this morning. We've been watching this tunnel rescue underway as we speak. We know rescuers were finally able to drill through the rocks and through the debris this morning to finally reach the 41 construction workers that have been trapped in a collapsed tunnel in the Himalayas here for the last 17 days. Just another angle of this live look as this is happening right now. We are getting word those workers are set to be pulled out, guys, one at a time on wheeled stretchers. And now imagine this. They're going to be pulled out through a pipe three feet wide and then they've got to go down that three mile long tunnel before they're finally out again a live look as this rescue operation continues no word yet on how those workers are doing we know they've been getting food water light oxygen medicine through a small pipe but there's been a series of snags with machines and getting them out that is uh, until now again taking you live to, to india here this morning where we're watching to see the first worker be pulled out we'll keep you posted as this continues to develop the holiday season is a hot time for deals and also a peak time for cyber criminals. I'm Angela Brown in Washington, D.C. Cybersecurity experts break down the threat to your job and also your wallet. Many Maryland lottery players are cashing in on some big prizes, but one remains unclaimed. Where are the unclaimed tickets coming from? 614, you're watching Fox 45 Morning News, all local, all morning.
617 in trending now. A mega multiplayer fast play ticket worth $100,000 remains unclaimed as of this morning. The ticket purchased over Thanksgiving weekend in Sykesville. It was Maryland's top prize of the past week. Three other players won $50,000. Two won on scratch offs. The other won on the daily bonus match five game. Winners of prizes larger than $25 must redeem their tickets at the Maryland Lottery Claim Center in Baltimore, which is open by appointment only. We'll take a look at this. The Great Wolf Lodge has officially launched its annual Snowland celebration at its Perryville location. It is open through January 8th. Families will experience a winter wonderland with daily snow showers, visits from Santa, and a variety of other festive activities. For more information, just go to our website, foxbaltimore.com. Looks like fun. Yeah, and speaking of Ooh, snow, it's taking like a fun. live look right here. This is Deep Creek Lakes Bridge. You know, if you've ever been out there, you know this bridge right here. You can see the uh, snow blowing right at the camera, and the roads are covered in snow from there all the way. Basically, you get to Cumberland, and there's nothing on the roads, but 68 the entire way in Western Maryland. Garrett County Schools, public schools, they're delayed two hours because of, well, you can see why. Man, oh man. I was a little off. I said December 2nd, we'd have snow in Maryland, and that. it's November 28th. So, yeah. December 2nd, actually, this weekend, it's going to be nice with temperatures back to the 50s. So, this, it's not like everybody's like, oh my, okay, we're in winter. Oh, just, you know, throw up everything, get your, you know, snow blower ready to go, all that stuff. That's not the case. This is just a little preview. Okay. It's, a, it's like, a you know, preview of a lot more wintry, to come or a little more. This shot looks wintry. It definitely does look wintry, Patricia, you're right, because we got some, we have some flakes that are flying around right now. It's kind of like one of those movie trailers when you're like, oh, this is like a really good movie. And it's like a three minute trailer. You're like, man, I don't want this trailer to end. And then it's going to end. And then we're back to, you know, just uh, more moderate stuff later this week. Yeah, the wind is blowing out there. Step outside right now, even though. It's not officially only at about, uh, well, west, south, west southwest at about 8 to 10 miles an hour. That's about all we're seeing right now. But definitely feels blustery already with our temperature at 37 degrees in Baltimore. Now, this is what the HD radar looks like. You can see some of those pockets of white being picked up on the radar. And yes, you step outside here from our station, wherever you might be living this morning or listening to us, and you're probably going to see at least a few flakes kind of flying around a bit. More of that actual snow that we just showed you there in Deep Creek and areas west of Cumberland continues to fall in western Maryland. This is all part of a larger weather system, so we have another cold front that is lurking to the west of us. That is going to be moving in as we get into the later part of the afternoon today, and that's what's going to pick up our wind and really <clears throat> excuse me, drop our temperatures in terms of our feels-like numbers. This is our future scan in terms of our wind speeds and our wind gusts in that 2 and 3 o'clock this afternoon hour. We're talking about 20 to 30 mile an hour gusts from the west and northwest. That is as the cold front passes through. Now, what that's going to do, the temperatures, the feels like numbers, only in the teens and 20s today. This is what it will feel like when you get the kids from school this afternoon or you just doing anything outdoors, 2, 3 o'clock, that's what you have to kind of prepare for. Also, tomorrow morning, not as much wind, but even just a light breeze, and we're going to have feels like temperatures in the single digits. That gets into the dangerous category. So Wednesday morning, definitely the coldest air of the year. you got to go back to about February of this year, February 25th to be exact, to have temperatures that have been colder than what we're going to see tomorrow morning. So as the kids get out this morning, beep, beep, make sure they're bundled up. It's still in the 30s here for the next couple of hours and we'll barely get to about 40 for you this afternoon. The wind is going to be the big issue for today. We're talking about temperatures in the low to mid 30s and a few lower 40s across Carroll and Baltimore counties for your high temps today. Hartford and Cecil counties mid to upper 30s for your highs later today. Typically lower 50s is where we are. We'll hang in the 40s tomorrow, but notice those temperatures steadily rising once we get to Thursday, Friday, and even this first weekend of December is looking pretty good. All right, so our future skin, those flurries that are kind of flying around now should move out of here by the afternoon. We'll have less wind on Wednesday. Temperature still chilly, a few clouds kind of hanging around. But Thursday, that starts the warming process, more of a southerly flow, what we call a return flow from the south. And then our next weather maker is rain, and that's coming in Friday morning and through most of Friday afternoon into the evening time. And believe me, if we had this much moisture right now, we'd be talking about a weather alert day with a bunch of snow. But not the case because those temperatures warm up as we head toward the weekend. Actually, not looking too bad for the mayor's Christmas parade on Sunday in Hamden. So hopefully we can keep that rain away and temperatures in the upper 50s by Sunday afternoon. Tom?
Great. All right. Thank you, Justin. Let's take a look at your Lynn Solar Traffic Network and around the Baltimore region. The three cameras you see on the uh, right side and the bottom there, wide open, no issues to report. The issue with the flashing lights, that's two vehicles. This is 70 eastbound right near Funkstown, which is actually um, right below Hagerstown. So that is happening 70 eastbound. And it's got some traffic backed up for miles because of the uh, two vehicles now over to the right side. So just one lane getting by. Here's a live look now from our traffic photo journalist. He is out cruising around looking for some of those snow flurries Justin's talking about. He's a 95 heading south of White Marsh, so wide open there too. Now we want to get a check of your mass transit. We have Mark Jones in the MTA. Good morning, Mark. Are you ready for the snow? No, please don't say snow. Please, <laughs> please. I guess I have to be. I have no choice. Uh, good morning, Tom. Good morning, everyone out there on the Mark Train system. You'll find 10 trains. 11 and Camden train 845 operating with five minute delays. The other trains look good for the commute start. If your ride is out there on Light Rail Link, it's looking good for travel in both directions and no delays or issues out there on Metro Subway. For the MTA Transit Team, I'm Mark Jones. Thank you, Mark. New police data shows more than a dozen juveniles have been arrested just in the past week. Coming up, we're going to take a look at some of the most recent cases, plus the concerning data about just how many times some of these kids have already been arrested. The man guilty of killing a popular restaurant manager in Little Italy sentenced. The reaction from the community and how long he'll be behind bars just ahead. You're watching Fox 45 Morning News, all local. All morning. Cyber Monday has come to a close. While many shoppers were buying online, cyber criminals were busy trying to steal your information and infiltrate companies. The National Desk Angela Brown explains. Security Magazine says cyber attacks increased during the holiday season and threats like ransomware are up 30 percent. High profile data breaches during the holidays at places where you shop. Remember the target data breach 2013? The credit and debit card information of about 40 million customers stolen 
Here's what Target CEO said in 2014 while trying to win back shoppers. We are completely focused on data security. We've got a great team in place. We built great systems. Darktrace, a cybersecurity company, reports 30% more ransomware attacks targeting organizations during the holiday period from 2018 to 2020 compared to the monthly average. What is the number one way these cyber crooks get in? You know, the number one way that they get in is actually through employees or through contractors who work for them. Valerie Aubend from Accenture says retailers need to be on the lookout for supply chain weaknesses and cyber criminals setting up fake websites. They develop legitimate websites that look like the company website, maybe a slight change right. in that website address, and unfortunately, it's a fake website. Phony websites used in emails attached to coupons all to steal your information. Even if it looks like an email you've subscribed to, even if it looks like a really great deal, you don't don't want to click on the link. Reporting in Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. Well, we are cold this morning with some areas near freezing. Still ahead when we can expect some warmer temperatures. And our countdown to Christmas contest continues this morning, taking a live look at our tree and still so much up for grabs. We've got Disney stuffed toys. We've got a lottery tree. We even have four tickets to see Miss Doubtfire next year at the Hippodrome. Doesn't get better than that. We're going to tell you when to call, so stick around and make sure you're paying attention. 628, you're watching Fox 45 Morning News, all local, all morning. Live from WBFF in Baltimore, this is Fox 45 Morning News. Snow is falling this morning. Taking a look at the video from our reporter Shannon Lilly. She's downtown Baltimore this morning, and you can see the flakes falling on the east side of Maryland and on the west side, Deep Creek. It's a lot uh, thicker snowfall. In fact, they have accumulation. So what I was going to say, those are just a few flakes, because right. if you look at the street, it kind of looks like the street is coated there. I don't it's know. It's not. Maybe I think it's, it's just gray. Right. But yeah, nothing just, sticking here. No. <laughs> 
Oh, it's bad enough that it's falling. Good morning on this Tuesday. Welcome back. 631 is the time. I'm Patrice Sanders. I'm Tom Rogers in Garrett County Schools. Your public schools, you're two hours delayed because you do have significant snow they that do. is falling there, but not over here. We're not going to get that. In fact, meteorologist Justin Chambers is like, just get ready for school, kids. That's right. I like if you look closer on uh, Shannon's shot can tell that she's inside the car, which is a good spot to be in, right? I mean, you can see right there, yeah. like the front windshield, and she's like, yeah, I'll show you guys the snow, but I'm not getting out of uh, it. So we're, we're, not, we're not weather alert. We don't have to have everybody out in the snow doing all that stuff. So yeah, we are seeing a few flakes that are flying around right now. Let's take you to the top of the uh, Transamerica building. You can see the wind that is blowing around some of these flakes, and I know it's kind of hard to see. The sun comes up in about 40 minutes or so from right now, but let me show you what's going on in the HD radar. And yes, some areas, Elk Ridge down through Ferdinand Heights, over toward Dundalk, Essex, and Middle River. Even seeing a few of those light snow showers around, around Pikesville. It's not much that's being picked up on the radar, which is exactly what we were seeing when you look outside. Just kind of a few of those flakes falling and really not much to accumulate. We're at 19 in Oakland, 29 in Cumberland, and then you can see most of us here in the Chesapeake are in the mid to upper 30s, so we're just above the freezing mark at this time. It is actually going to be colder tomorrow morning than it is this morning, but on your morning drive just be aware of the flakes flying and temperatures that hang out in the 30s for the next few hours we'll try to get to 40 today and we'll see those lower 40s tomorrow as well and then mid 50s on thursday so it's a brief taste of winter before we get right back to some more moderate temperatures by the end of the week back with your full forecast coming up in just a few all right, taking a look at the Lynn Solar Traffic Network, and we are tracking an accident in Washington County at 170 East, right near Hagerstown. Two vehicles are involved. You see the backup and emergency crews working to clear it. That's what all the lights are there this morning. But in the other three cameras, as you take a look around, everybody else moving along just fine. It seems like the issue's gotten so bad that I, I feel that there's going to be some sort of reform passed. New data released from the Baltimore Police Department shows 15 young people have been arrested for various crimes in the past five days across nearly half of the city's police districts. Police arresting seven juveniles for a car theft in the Northern District Sunday. The youngest, just 12 years old, police say one of the 15-year-old suspects have been arrested eight times. In the Southern District Friday, two 15-year-olds and a 14-year-old were arrested for holding a man at gunpoint, demanding his keys. That's according to the Baltimore Police Department. Officers arresting the teens in a stolen car, saying one of the teens had already been arrested three times on stolen car charges. Now, the Baltimore Police Department tells us four teens robbed a man and assaulted him at gunpoint near Par uh, Patterson Park last Wednesday in the Southeast District. All four of them were arrested. In the Eastern District, that same day, Fox Trot tracked down two teens who stole a car. Police say they then recovered drugs and a stolen gun when they arrested the suspects. Shannon Lilly is joining us live from Baltimore Police Headquarters with a look at more recent examples of juveniles accused of committing crimes. Shannon. Yeah, and this morning, Patrice, we're taking a look at some of the latest data from Baltimore police, which shows us that 15 juveniles have been arrested since Wednesday for various crimes around the city. And for some of these juveniles, this is not their first or even their second arrest. The big thing is claiming that the four juveniles, um, high schoolers, dressing all black, uh, went towards the park. They utilize a handgun. You're listening to Dispatch on the eve of Thanksgiving as police were called to Baltimore's Patterson Park after a victim says they were robbed at gunpoint by a group of juveniles. Just days later, a rash of armed robberies hit the Pigtown area. The majority of the suspects were told in this case, also juveniles. If BPD says, well, we're arresting them, and you see that, you know, on the report that, you know, that they're, or at least they were in custody and they were taken downtown, so you know that. Uh, DJS says that you know we're giving them services and look at our chart and here's how great this is working but yet down here you know there's a lot of instances with our own eyes with our cameras with whatever you know we use whatever evidence it seems like there are kids slipping through those cracks 
There have been more than 10,000 car thefts reported in Baltimore so far this year. Last week, BPD revealed about 38% of these thefts were committed by juveniles. The breakdown even more concerning, with about two-thirds of those suspects reported to the Department of Juvenile Services and only 5% serving time in a DJS facility. Now, in one of those most recent cases that police have announced, they tell us that they took seven juveniles into custody for auto theft. One of those juveniles had already been arrested eight times prior. Reporting live from police headquarters, I'm Shannon Lilly, Fox 45 Morning News. Elsewhere in a city in crisis nearly two years after a popular Little Italy restaurant manager, Chesley Patterson, was shot dead. The man who admitted to murdering him receives a sentence. Taylor Stewart is joining us live this morning with more of what Samuel Wise is now facing. Taylor? That's right, pleading guilty and now facing 50 years behind bars, followed by three years of probation. You'll remember this incident that happened back in 2022. Now, surveillance video actually captured it on camera right near the La Scala restaurant. In it, you can see Patterson walking from his car, then going back as he returns, a van is pulling up. The prosecutors say it was here that Wise jumped out of the car, up the front of that van. He went over to Patterson's car, struggled with him before shooting. It was someone that uh, everyone liked, and uh, it was sad to hear of the situation. He pleaded guilty. That's great. I'm happy to hear that because he has to pay for what he has done. Now, this latest development comes near the second anniversary of this murder. It's approaching next January and hopefully bringing some loved ones to folks who live here in the Little Italy community, restauranters, as well as his loved ones. We will continue to follow this and give you the latest updates. We're live in Baltimore. Taylor Stewart, Fox 45 News. It's bad. Like, children shouldn't even have any type of access to a gun. That's horrible. A teacher discovers a gun in a student's backpack. Why the juvenile crime laws could impact Baltimore, uh, the investigation. Our people can't, can't deal with the financial impact that the, the current as it stands is placed upon our taxpayers and our citizens. Maryland lawmakers will be facing some pressure to scale back landmark legislation that brought massive increases to education spending. Still ahead, the three main concerns county leaders want the state to address and temperatures will be in the 30s and may just get to the 40s for the afternoon. Meteorologist Justin Chambers lets us know how long these cold conditions will last. 639, you're watching Fox 45 Morning News, all local, all morning. Weather Window, presented by the National Weather Desk. Quite a downpour early Monday morning in West Palm Beach. A front stalled out, resulting in their quick but very heavy rainfall. No rain, but a very pronounced sun dog appeared near Albany, New York. They're caused by the refraction of light through ice crystals. And it was a picture-perfect sunrise Monday over the Natchez River, not far from Beaumont, Texas. Listen to Off the Radar, new episodes every Tuesday. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.
We're just about 18 minutes in front of 7 o'clock on your Tuesday morning. This is what it looks like outside right now from our Toyota Inner Harbor Sky Cam. That wind is already picking up, and we're going to be dealing with the wind chill numbers later today that will be in the teens and 20s. So even though our highs today will be in the upper 30s, which isn't that impressive, we're going to feel even colder than that. Definitely bundle up. Have the sunglasses ready to go. We will get more sun as we get later into the afternoon. Really no need for the umbrella, but a few flakes are flying around right now. So if you do want to get up for a run or a jog, maybe you want to do an inside session. Temperature staying in the 30s through the course of the morning. 643 in Prince George's County, an investigation underway after a shooting in Landover was all caught on camera. And we want to warn you that the video you're about to see may be disturbing. And surveillance video shows at least five people dressed in dark clothing coming out of a parked car, then just shooting at a man who came out of his house. You see him running at the bottom of the screen at the end of this. You also see somebody walking their dog tucked behind that SUV. They seem to be okay. They're going after one person in particular. Police say that man was shot multiple times. He is expected to be okay. Neighbors say bullets went through the window of a home and a parked car. Police are asking anyone with information on this incident to contact them. The juvenile crime crisis continues to plague Maryland. Still ahead, the specific changes some lawmakers and prosecutors are pushing for. A Maryland law is overturned, making it easier for people to get a gun. The effect this ruling could have on other gun laws in Maryland. 644, you're watching Fox 45 Morning News, all local, all morning. Six forty six now Baltimore City School administrators confirm a gun was discovered inside a student's backpack at the Creative City Charter School in Park Heights. Shannon Lilly is joining us live now from police headquarters with how parents are reacting to this. Shannon. Well, they're understandably concerned, Patrice, and they cannot fathom why a child would have a gun. Sources confirmed to us that a seven year old was found with it 
in his backpack and police say that a school staff member received a tip, inspected the backpack and confirmed that there was a weapon inside. We also spoke with a parent who says her 17 year old child was there to witness that. So we're going to hear from that parent coming up in the next 15 minutes. Plus hear why police may have their hands tied when it comes to taking action in these kinds of cases. Now back to you. Thank you, Shannon. And yeah, cold and we are seeing some snowflakes. Uh, we are. Meteorologist Justin Chambers. It's November. Too soon, Justin. Wait, isn't soon. this the day that you're going to get in a dunk tank or something like I that? I am. <laughs> and we're seeing snowflakes. I, yeah. I'm going to be dunked outside yeah, along with several other cube. people. You better have an, yeah. uh, an ambulance nearby. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's all for charity, so it's not <laughs> cold when it's for charity, yeah, right? Yeah, but it's even colder in Carroll County. Aren't you getting dunked in Carroll oh, yeah. County? It's oh. like colder there. Yeah, Always absolutely. Colder. Always colder Anything in Carroll County. Anything for the kids. It's for the Boys and Girls Club. <laughs> do what you got to do. Just make sure to warm up afterwards. Our Towson Cam, good morning to you. We are seeing uh, some of those clouds kind of hanging around right now. The sun coming up in just a little bit. Our Mile One Auto Group Cam and our temperatures that are actually above freezing. We're actually at 37 right now. We're going to be colder tomorrow morning. That westerly wind about 8 to 15 miles an hour, making our wind chill feels like we're at 31. So that's what you have to kind of prepare for as you step outside. And you can see right now on our HD radar, just a couple of light showers, maybe getting a little burst right there. Ellicott City down through Elk Ridge, south of our Butis moving over toward Glen Burnie and Pasadena over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Where we're seeing more of the heavier snow is in western Maryland. And we have a shot right there that I want to show you. This is near Kaiser's Ridge where we have the snow that continues to fall. And this is what it looks like on the roads. A snowplow goes by on cue. How did we manage that? That was pretty cool. Man, those producers in the back are good. Either way, um, this is what it looks like in Western Maryland. Tom's been talking about how Garrett County schools are on two-hour delays, and once you get on 68 West, you have to deal with that snow that continues to fall. All part of this area of low pressure and this cold front that is just to the west of us. Now, this is the cold front that is to the west of us right now that's going to be coming through this afternoon. That's what's going to pick up our wind and really drop our temperatures. So as I mentioned, we're going to be even colder tomorrow morning. These are your feels like numbers here as we get into Tuesday afternoon, teens and 20s across the region. So even though we'll have the sun out there, that wind is going to make it feel quite a bit colder. And tomorrow morning, we get in that dangerous category where we're talking about single digit wind chill numbers and teens as you get up on early on your Wednesday. On your Rise and Shine cast for today, mid to upper 30s over the next couple of hours, we'll get more of that sun coming up just after 7 o'clock here this morning. And by 10 a.m., we'll be those see those numbers in the mid to upper 30s for you there in Westminster and numbers hanging out in the 30s for most of the day. Some of us will sneak close to about 40 degrees by the afternoon and back into the low to mid 30s for your Taco Tuesday right about 5 p.m. Here's a look at your high temps. 53 is where we typically are. We're going to flip that number around in Cockeysville and only give you 35. Same number there in Bel Air, 37 Chestertown, 38 in Stevensville, right about 40 in Baltimore City. Up and down the 95 corridor, not much better. Most of that cold air is moving in and that's why we've got 30s and 40s. Tomorrow we stay cold, but by Thursday and Friday, we're right back to the mid 50s and we actually slide above average as we head into this first weekend of December. So our future scan staying dry today through the afternoon after these clouds and the flakes kind of move out of here. A few clouds are on tomorrow. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then we get more of a southerly flow on Thursday that helps to warm us up and our next weather maker bringing rain to us. So Friday morning, we'll start with a few showers. Most of Friday afternoon into the evening time will be rainy. Just a couple of uh, scattered showers and kind of light rain that will be with us here on Friday. Saturday we dry out. We'll keep the clouds around. Sunday looks mainly dry right now. And then on Monday, another round of showers into early next week. Tom. All right, thank you, Justin. It's time to open up the next gift in our countdown to Christmas giveaway. So here we go. We're going to open up this gift first. Then you call in to win it if you want it. All right, go for it. All right. And some pretty good thick wrapping paper we're using here for the hat. Oh, okay. I don't know if you can open that part, but this gift is a uh, gnome on the roam family adventure and creativity kit. So the kit is great for kids to create their own adventures and stories. It is uh, a gift set worth $40. It's available through Amazon and once you open it, there's a whole world of wonder inside. Not bad at all. You even get your own little tiny little gnome right there. 
All right, well, now it's your time yeah. to call. The number is on your screen, 410-469-8308. And caller number 10 right now gets to take this gift home. So yep. good luck. Not bad. All right, nice little carrying case, too. We'll uncover the history behind the Maryland Nutcracker. Still ahead, how local influences are intertwined into the classic masterpiece. Elevate your festive celebrations with a holiday cocktail. Come on, mm. still ahead in our 9 o'clock hour. It's after 5 o'clock. Simple things that you can do to toast to the holidays in style. An espresso martini? Is espresso that, martini. Does that it ties care in. Of the coffee break as well? Yeah, in fact, let's all partake. Enjoy for a coffee break. Well, making your headlines this Tuesday morning in Washington state, police are investigating after they say a teenager in a stolen Kia killed another driver. And get this, the boy is not even old enough to have a driver's license. This all happened early Sunday morning along State Route 7. Troopers say the victim was attempting to make a U-turn. Jeremy Harris with our Sinclair sister station in Seattle spoke with frustrated neighbors in that area who say the issues with stolen cars are out of control. Early Sunday morning on a dark and foggy stretch of road, a deputy's body camera capturing the scene where a teenager is accused of crashing a stolen Kia into another car on the south end of Spanaway. That teen, blurred here, survived. The other driver did not. 
I'm devastated. I'm very devastated. Faye owns this store next to where the crash happened. A person's life was, was taken because of this kid. Faye says the whole town is frustrated with the disturbing trend of young people stealing Kias and racing around town. But they're out here drag racing and, and speeding and racing each other, and a lot of times there are Kias. Police have warned of a social media trend that shows teens how to quickly steal certain models of Kias and Hyundais. It's known as the Kia Boys, and it's fueling a rise in car theft nationwide. The National Crime Insurance Bureau said Washington had a 31 percent jump in stolen cars between 2019 and 2022, the highest of any state in the country. Earlier this year, police say two teens in a stolen Kia crashed into a semi-truck after fleeing a robbery scene in Pierce County. The driver of that semi was ejected and died at the scene. No respect. Absolutely none. Diane lives in Spanaway and calls this weekend's crash heartbreaking. Made me sick to my stomach. She and others we talked to say they feel like teens have no fear of consequences for stealing cars, and they know this won't be the last time this happens. It's deemed to happen again, and I hope not, but it's deemed to happen again. In Spanaway, Jeremy Harris. The teenager was also hospitalized. As of now, officers do not know exactly what charges he'll be facing or if he'll be booked into detention once he's out of the hospital. There has to be accountability. Here in Baltimore, according to data from the police department, juveniles are responsible for 38% of cars stolen this year in Baltimore, but only two thirds of those suspects are reported to DJS and only 5% end up serving time in a DJS facility. All others receive probation or have their charges postponed, withdrawn or dismissed. Now, the Baltimore Police Department has given out more than 3000 steering wheel locks to residents, but these auto thefts are still happening. Fox 45 spoke with one man who had a lock on his steering wheel, but his car was still stolen for a second time over this past holiday weekend. I'm the victim. But I'm being treated like the the villain. I mean, these guys go around stealing these cars each and every day, tearing people's cars up, and we got to dig in our pockets for something that they done destructed. Right. It's not right. right. And the city needs to do something. Now, BPD sent a statement yesterday afternoon saying in part they are working to address the surge in auto thefts and that they've seen a 21% reduction in auto thefts in the last 28 days. Well, Mayor Brandon Scott is addressing the auto theft, saying that his administration is wholeheartedly committed to tackling the issue. The mayor says as police arrest the same individuals for the same crimes, it's time for other parts of the justice system to do their part. Mayor Scott has called for a complete overhaul of the Department of Juvenile Services before, but has not offered specifics about changes that he wants to see. Well, if you have a stolen car story or... If you know someone who's been impacted by the spike in auto thefts, we want to hear about it. Scan the QR code on your screen and tell us what happened or send us an email at news at foxbaltimore.com. A child found with a gun in his pocket at a or in his backpack at a Baltimore City school. Coming up, we're going to talk about the concern from parents and why police may be limited in the action they can take in these kinds of cases. Just see her with my, with my own eyes to see that she's not hurt. She can smile. Uh, she talks to me. She hugged me. Yeah, tearful reunions, the unforgettable moments for dozens of families reunited with their loved ones who were taken captive by Hamas as efforts are underway to free even more hostages. Our temperatures are cold this morning, even dealing with a few flakes flying around. We'll talk about how long this winter wonderland will last. Fox 45 Morning News rolls on right now. Live from WBFF in Baltimore, this is Fox 45 Morning News. Good morning. On this Tuesday, November 28th, it is Giving Tuesday. I'm Patrice Sanders. I'm Tom Rogers. It's also, well, flurries flying around Tuesday morning. In fact, you may even see the same flurry once or twice because it's so windy. It kind of whips around. So you may count one, but it's the same one that you'll see again. 
It's not One sticky. One is too many. Meteorologist <laughs> Justin Chambers is here. Well, the weather outside is frightful, so that's what they say, you know. And uh, we're talking about some snow showers in western Maryland. We've had a few flakes that have been flying around parts of Baltimore, even a light dusting on some of the cars in the parking lot. Just checked that a few moments ago, so you may wake up to that. Taxi! You can see it on the bottom of the screen. A little cold on that water taxi this morning. Temperatures statewide, teens in western Maryland, 28 in Cumberland. Most of us are in the mid to upper 30s, so we're actually above freezing here. Westminster and Bel Air at 30. 34, uh, 36 and 34, respectively. A cold Tuesday morning, a blustery day ahead. That wind is going to be no joke this afternoon, and then we'll finally get warmer a little bit later this week. So you can see in your day planner those temperatures where they are right now. They're not going much higher. May, maybe to about 40 degrees. The west northwesterly wind at 15 to 30 miles an hour is going to make it feel colder than that throughout the course of the afternoon. If you can believe it, it's actually going to be even colder tomorrow morning. We'll take a closer look at that coming up in a few. All right, so how are the cold temperatures and wind impacting traffic, Tom? Uh, that's the big question. If you're heading out west, you've got some issues. But look at this. The western part of the state has got all the snow. Around here, not bad at all. In fact, there are no issues to report, knock on wood, right now around the Baltimore region when you take a look at your Lynn Solar Traffic Network. This morning, Fox 45 News is following two big stories surrounding the juvenile crime crisis here in Maryland. Yeah, calls for more action from legislators. They're growing after new data from the Baltimore Police Department highlights a violent holiday weekend in the city. Those juvenile crime concerns are extending to Picktown, where police say a majority of suspects in a recent string of robberies are juveniles. Sources also are telling us a seven-year-old was found with a gun in his backpack last week at a Baltimore public school. This morning, parents, they're concerned. Well, this morning, we have live team coverage when it comes to demanding answers to the juvenile crime crisis. In a few minutes, Taylor Stewart will be live with how Fox 45 News is pressing lawmakers on the state's juvenile justice laws. But we begin with Shannon Lilly. She is live from the Baltimore Police Headquarters with why those laws could be impacting the investigation into that seven-year-old who is accused of having a gun. Shannon. Well, because of the child's age, Patrice, juvenile reform laws prohibit officers from charging the child or even questioning the child. Now, as of this morning, Baltimore police have not yet indicated that they know who owns the gun, but sources do confirm to us that it was found in the backpack of a seven-year-old. Now, this was all unfolding at the Creative City Charter School in Park Heights. And in a statement, police describe a bit more on what happened, writing, quote, a member of the school's staff received an anonymous tip regarding a student possessing a weapon concealed in their backpack. The staff member proceeded to inspect the backpack and visually confirmed the presence of the weapon. This weapon was removed and officers were notified. Now we spoke with a parent, Kendra Nelson. She says her seven year old watched as teachers discovered that weapon. He actually saw uh, the gun that the child had in class. I would say the child obviously got it from an adult. So where's the conversation being had with the adults in that child's life? In a letter to parents, school administrators say the student was detained and will be addressed. They also encouraged parents to talk to your child about safety and monitor what your child brings to school. But because of juvenile reform laws, retired city police officer Daryl Burham says Police action is now severely limited, even when guns are found in schools. It may be show and tell until somebody confronts them. And I do believe push comes to shove when it comes down to, they wouldn't hesitate to shoot somebody. They have no fear. They have, there's no consequence. Well, our sources are telling us that that student has been transferred to an alternative school. As for police, there is no indication yet on whether they will be pursuing the owner of the gun. Reporting live from police headquarters, I'm Shannon Lilly, Fox 45 Morning News. Well, this incident is just the latest, leading to questions about Maryland's juvenile justice laws. Earlier this month, a 12 and 14 year old were caught on camera allegedly beating a woman and trying to steal the keys to her car in Butchers Hill. They were released after just a few hours following a call from DJS to Baltimore police. Then in Montgomery County, a 12 year old is accused of making seven school threats in a three week period in October. And he allegedly told police that he knew he wouldn't face charges because of the state's laws. 706 now parents, police, prosecutors, they've been complaining about the juvenile crime for months, calling for accountability for young people. 
Today, the Baltimore City delegation is holding their fourth annual pre-session hearing. Everyone is welcome to speak up and share their insight on how to make improvements within the city. And this meeting is virtual and will be held tonight from 6 to 8. This meeting comes on the heels of other state delegates voicing the need for lawmakers to take action. State delegate Nino Maggioni says something needs to be done. As an elected official, number one priority, an obligation to push policies that result in more public safety. And there's no better message to send to potential would-be juvenile criminals than prepare to pay the price. You're no longer getting away with it. Well, another lawmaker is calling for patience, saying these juvenile crime laws haven't been in place long enough to see their impact. Taylor Seward is joining us live with why a county state's attorney and a state delegate say we can't afford to wait. Taylor. That's right. That's the center of this debate. Wait or make some changes right now. And it really comes down to just a handful of juvenile justice reform laws that were passed in the last year. But at the forefront of this latest push, we've seen John McCarthy. He's the state's attorney for Montgomery County. And the laws he's taking issue with, one of them that prevents children 13 under from being charged with uh, nonviolent misdemeanors. The other here is what prohibits uh, police from talking to a juvenile without an attorney's per present and a parent's permission. However, keep in mind here, Senator Will Smith, he chairs the powerful Senate Judicial Proceedings Committee, and last week he indicated he's not on board with a full repeal. Smith says the juvenile justice laws just need more time to see those results. We put in place are going to take a couple of years uh, to fully see the kind of the fruit uh, of the foundations that we've laid and the seeds that we've planted. I, for one, am not interested in rolling back uh, the reforms that we put in place last year. We've got to look at services. We've got to look at options. We've got to look at more flexibility for probation. Now, McCarthy says he understands the idea behind the plan here and agrees a full repeal probably isn't necessary. But he hinted at and really, truly gave specifics, as we've been asking for, about changes he wants to see, like review all felonies, address some of the probationary limits, and give some faith and discretion back to judges. Again, that House Judiciary Proceedings um, Committee is scheduled for next Tuesday. We'll, of course, be following that. Taylor, have lawmakers representing Baltimore or even some of the surrounding uh, counties spoken about this and what they want to do, how they want to repeal it or amend it? Uh, Patrice, we've, we've heard from several people speaking out about these laws. Most recently, we heard from a Baltimore County Representative, excuse me here, Baltimore County Representative Robin Grammer. He's a Republican, and he says it's time for real change. Take a listen. People have to frankly stop playing so close to the chest and have uh, start having real discussions about this issue. Now, we'll continue to see how this proceeds. He also sits on that Judicial Proceeding Committee, so he will be at the center of a lot of those conversations. When they come up next session, we, of course, will bring you the latest as we get there. Taylor Stewart, Fox 45 Morning News. Thank you, Taylor. This brings us to our question of the day. Do you want your elected leaders to hold young children accountable? So far, 99% of those who have voted say yes. You can make your voice heard right now by going to foxbaltimore.com slash vote. We have new details at this morning in Anne Arundel County. Police are investigating a deadly crash that happened on Thanksgiving. Officials say 54 year old Kevin Christ was hit while crossing Ritchie Highway in Glen Burnie on Thursday by a 77 year old man. Police say Chris was wearing all black clothing and was not using a crosswalk. The accident is still under investigation. We want to give you a warning. The next video you're about to see, some say is graphic, others say it's disturbing. In Prince George's County, an investigation is now underway after a shooting in Landover was all caught on camera. The surveillance video shows at least five people dressed in dark clothing coming out of a parked car, then start shooting at a man who was coming out of his house. Police say that man was shot multiple times. You see him running away at the bottom of the screen there. He is expected to be okay. Neighbors say bullets went through the window of a home, a parked car. Police are asking anyone with information on this incident to contact them. 
Israel and Hamas are now agreeing to extend the war pause for an additional two days. And today, there is a possibility that more hostages could be freed. We want to get right over to Megan Gillen. She's in our live center with the negotiations that are underway right now. Megan? Yeah, Tom Patrice, this could be big. We are taking you live to Gaza here this morning. Still smoke filling the air as we look live there. So far in this war pause, this has allowed for the release of 150 Palestinians detained for criminal offenses and the freedom of 69 Hamas held hostages. It's a fraction of that 240 that were kidnapped in the October 7th massacre, many of who are still being held captive here in Gaza right now. But this morning, we know the families of those freed are certainly reuniting, rejoicing. Take a look at this video here. This was just released by the Israeli military showing the moment hostages crossed that border into Israel yesterday into freedom after more than 50 days of being held captive by Hamas in Gaza. Taking you live now to the White House where the Biden administration is still holding out hope that two more Americans will be released during this extended two-day truce. We know Hamas has agreed to release 20 people in total over the next several days. We also know today U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will visit Israel for his third trip since the start of the war. Another big story that we have been following here this morning, guys, breaking right now, taking you live back out to India, where we have been watching this, this tunnel rescue underway as we speak. We know that rescuers were able to drill through the rocks and the debris here this morning, finally reaching the 41 construction workers that have been trapped in a collapsed tunnel in the Him Himalayas here for the last 17 days. We are getting word those workers are set to be pulled out any moment now. They're going to be pulled out one at a time on wheeled stretchers. And get this, it's going to be through a pipe three feet wide down a three mile long tunnel. Again, taking a live look at that operation, that rescue mission is underway here this morning. They're hoping to get all 41 of those construction workers out here in the coming hours. No word yet on how they're, how they're doing. We do know that they've been getting food, water, light, oxygen, even medicine through a pipe. But there's been a series of snags with machines and actually getting them out. That is until now. We're going to keep an eye on this. We'll let you know as soon as we see that first worker be pulled from the tunnel. Back to you, Patrice. All right, that's amazing. Here's a look at the stories making headlines at this hour. The news isn't isn't good. I mean, I cannot deal with a $40 million increase in my education budget next year. Pressure is mounting for state lawmakers to scale back a funding increase to Maryland's Kerwin plan. Our Project Baltimore team breaks down the impacts this could have on taxpayers' wallets. Only one direction to go from here. The biggest change is that we need to start focusing on punishing the bad behavior. After the break, the specific changes some lawmakers are pushing in order to address juvenile crime all across our state. 714 is the time. You're watching Fox 45 Morning News. We're all local. All
716 Fox 45 News continues following the juvenile crime crisis across Maryland. Young people often committing violent crimes resulting in no real consequences. Police, prosecutors and parents all joining the calls to change the juvenile justice laws that they say keep authorities from holding young people accountable. Delegate Kathy Schlager from Baltimore County is joining us live to weigh in. Good morning, Delegate. Good morning, Tom. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. The big question is, what do you think needs to change when it comes to the current juvenile justice laws in Maryland? Well, I'd say just about everything. Um, you know, human nature tells us that you get more of what you reward and you get less of what you punish or discourage. So what the state of Maryland has done, and unfortunately other states across the country, has been to spend more time coddling criminals than protecting victims. Um, the juvenile situation is at a crisis. Uh, just last week, Baltimore City reports that they've arrested 18 juveniles. We don't know how many they couldn't arrest because they can't arrest anyone under 13. So we really need to just turn the corner here, get tough on crime, tell juveniles that this antisocial, illegal criminal behavior will not be tolerated. And uh, Delegate Schlager, we know that Senator Will Smith, the Democrat from Montgomery County, has indicated he is not on board with a full repeal of the Juvenile Justice Reform Act and the Child Interrogation Protection Act and says that they need more time to see full results. Do you agree with him? I can't disagree with uh, Senator Smith more. Time has come, time has passed. This, uh, you know, experiment has created thousands of victims. I, I watch on Fox 45 a, a man whose car was stolen twice, twice. And the first time it cost him $8,000. How many victims do we need before politicians will say it's enough? Juveniles who commit crime need to be detained and many of them probably need to go to a juvenile detention center. Uh, last question, we have 20 seconds left, Delegate. Will this be number one priority, though, coming into the session for you? Yes, it is number one priority. I'm uh, sponsoring a bill with Delegate Nick Kipke to totally repeal the Juvenile uh, Reform Acts that were made a few years ago. Of course, you know, we're going to work to make stealing a gun a felony, violent uh, criminal reoffenders. If you're a criminal and you have a firearm, you should go to jail. Uh, it should be that simple. Let's not focus on law-abiding firearm owners. Let's focus on criminals and juveniles who are not permitted to have a firearm. Okay. Let's put them in jail. Delegate Kathy Schlega, thank you. Thanks. It is 719 now, and we need to get another check of a cold forecast. Yeah, meteorologist Justin Chambers talking about the uh, flurry forecast and also the breeze and the winds that will be coming with it. Yeah, the snow on November 28th is what we're seeing right now. The sun is up over the inner harbor. Some of our flurries are kind of moving out of the area. Some of you with a little light dusting on your car. And we're seeing the current wind chill numbers in the 20s. So even though that wind is not picked up yet, we are seeing those 20s as feels like temperatures. That's what we have to account for when we head outside. Another little burst of snow right around Reisterstown over toward Owings Mills. Not much right there. Again, this is little light burst that we're seeing, but where the snow is really falling, this is over in Garrett County where we are seeing some heavy bursts of snow. And as you zoom in a little bit closer, this is actually a snow squall warning. We don't see this very often, but when you get the wind and the snow combined with that, it is a dangerous situation, especially on highway or interstate 68. I want to take that shot right there if we can. This is actually from Garrett County. Now, it's not snowing heavily at this time, but you can see just one car out there on the road, and uh, those roads are not looking good right now. That's because that snow is falling in western Maryland. So, again, that snow squall warning is between exits 19 and 30 on Interstate 68. And again, this is for Garrett County through 745 this morning. I was surprised to see that. But again, you get the wind and the snow, and that's what we're dealing with here. Uh, it's a very dynamic system. We don't have a lot of moisture, but it doesn't take much to get those snowflakes flying, and that wind is definitely starting to kick up along this cold front that is just to the west of us right now. This front will be moving through as we get into the afternoon today, and that's what's going to pick up our wind, but also dropping our temperatures. So these are your feels-like temperatures in the 2 and 3 o'clock hour this afternoon combined with the wind and those cold numbers teens and 20s that's what you have to prepare for as you head outside this afternoon and especially tomorrow morning some single digit wind chills and teens are going to be
be around pretty much widespread. So make sure those kids are bundled up right now. Beep, beep. And then also tomorrow morning as well. That's what we're looking at with temperatures only in the upper 30s and barely to about 40 by the time we get into that 2 and 3 o'clock hour this afternoon. Most of us hang in the 30s, but I just showed you that wind chill map. So even though our temps will be in the 30s, which is cold by itself, you've got to prepare for temps in the teens and 20s, and that feels like category. Ellicott City, Elk Ridge, down through Glen Burnie and Pasadena, mid to upper 30s today. Even my friends on the eastern shore will only be in the 30s. Now, finally tomorrow, less wind as the system passes through. Still cold, but on Thursday, we get a nice little warming trend right as we approach the weekend. And yes, we're tracking another weather maker that's going to bring some rain by Friday. But look at those numbers. After 40s today and tomorrow, mid 50s Thursday and Friday, and then mid to upper 50s for this upcoming weekend. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas here in our studio this month. Fox 45 Morning News is doing our countdown to Christmas giveaway, which gives our viewers a chance to call in and win one of the amazing prizes under our tree. In fact, Quintina from Catonsville won our first gift this morning, but some other items they're still up for grab. Uh, they're the AAA gift pack and membership, tickets to see Miss Doubtfire at the Hippodrome, a brand new mattress, even a lottery tree. So make sure you keep watching this morning on Fox 45 Morning News. Your chance to win is coming up in the next 30 minutes. Good luck. It's the holiday season, and you can say that we're getting into the proper Christmas spirits on Fox 45 Morning News in our 9 o'clock hour, the holiday cocktails that will make your Christmas party merry and bright. And ballet embodies production of the Nutcracker is on the way. It really is beginning to look a lot like Christmas. We'll tell you about it coming up on Fox 45 Morning News, all local, all morning long. Seven twenty-six, and what's more Christmas than the Nutcracker? How about a Maryland Nutcracker? No, Some old bay on those nuts. Do tell, Mark Clark dancing with the sugar plums <laughs> at the ballet, Mark. <laughs> 
Your writers are amazing, guys. You're funny. Yes, <laughs> the Nutcracker. <laughs> I'm with Emily and Emily. So we have the uh, Embody Ballet production of the Nutcracker. How is it different? It has a, a Maryland splash to it, right? Sure. So Ballet Embody is the production of the Maryland Nutcracker. has your traditional Nutcracker elements. It's the story of Clara with her Nutcracker doll <laughs> traveling to a, a magical world. That This magical world um, takes us from the wintry mix of Maryland <laughs> all the way down the ocean we have a ocean city beach waltz we have orioles crabs right here you're seeing the traditional party scene um, but ballet and body's production of the, of the nutcracker is particularly special because we involve different maryland icons right over here we have the maryland state flag in a tutu it's my very favorite tutu i love it I love it. You can, you can feel the Maryland. Yeah. I can feel the Maryland, I think, aided by a Patrice and Tom's intro, but we're excited about it. And we're here this morning, guys. We'll be sharing the different ideas, but it is, I mean, you can, if, if it smells like Maryland in here right now. <laughs> the old bay's in the air. Yeah, I can smell it. <laughs> All right. There you go, Mark. Yeah, always a good time right there, <laughs> and uh, especially with the Nutcracker. For more information about where you can go see it, you can go to our website, foxbaltimore.com slash newslinks. Well, a cold start to our morning and a blustery afternoon ahead with wind chill values in the 20s. Meteorologist Justin Chambers is tracking our next chance for a warm up that's coming in his full forecast. New police data shows more than a dozen juveniles have been arrested in the last week. Coming up, we're going to take a look at some of the most recent cases and the concerning number of prior arrests some of these kids already have. You're watching Fox 45 Morning News, all local all morning. Live from WBFF in Baltimore, this is Fox 45 Morning News. Welcome back on this Tuesday morning. 7.31 is the time as I see sun and snow right. in that same shot. Do you see the flurries? Go look at the flurries. It's over Towson right now. Live look over Towson, and you can see it. They almost look like ice crystals falling. All right. 
Well, good morning to you. I'm Patrice Sanders. I'm Tom Rogers. They're not sticking. They're just blowing all the way around. They may be the same ones that came from Carroll County earlier, the same flurries that are just picked up and blowing down as we go towards the eastern shore. Let them blow away. Meteorologist Justin Chambers is here. DGZ, that is what we need, guys, the dendritic growth zone. So that's what you need to get those snowflakes to actually grow and accumulate and then fall out of the sky. So we're seeing some of that. Yeah, a lot of that is kind of wind driven and some of those flakes have accumulated at least on the tops of your cars this morning, but the sun is now up. The wind is definitely the biggest issue. Look at the wind gusts right now, anywhere from 60 to 23 miles an hour, and we haven't even seen the peak of the wind yet. That's making it feel like we're in the 20s. So all around the region, it feels like below freezing temperatures as you step outside. So on your morning drive, you'll definitely want that heater on. Our temps stay above freezing, but that's not really much of uh, encouragement because we're going to see those temperatures that will stay only to about 40 today. 42 tomorrow, it will be a lot less windy on Wednesday. Thursday looks good. We're talking about mid-50s with more sunshine rolling in as well. We're back with your full forecast. We'll take you through that and let you know exactly what to expect coming up in a few minutes from right now. Thank you, Justin. 732. Now to a city in crisis. Baltimore Police Department is telling us four teens robbed a man and assaulted him at gunpoint right near Patterson Park just last Wednesday in the Southeast District. All four were arrested. And in the Eastern District the same day, Foxtrot tracking down two teens who stole a vehicle. Police say they then recovered drugs and the stolen gun when they arrested the suspects. Shannon Lilly is joining us live from Baltimore's Police Department headquarters with a look at the more recent examples of juvenile crime. Shannon. Yeah, and this morning, Tom, we're taking a look at some of the most recent police data showing that 15 juveniles have been arrested for various crimes around the city since Wednesday. And for many of these juveniles, this is not their first or even second arrest. The victim is claiming that the four juveniles, um, high schoolers, dressing all black, uh, went towards the park. They utilized a handgun. You're listening to Dispatch on the eve of Thanksgiving as police were called to Baltimore's Patterson Park after a victim says they were robbed at gunpoint by a group of juveniles. Well, just days later, a rash of armed robberies hit the Picktown area. The majority of the suspects there were told also juveniles. If BPD says, well, we're arresting them, and you see that, you know, on the report that, you know, that they're, or at least they were in custody and they were taken downtown, so you know that. Uh, DJS says that you know we're giving them services and look at our chart and here's how great this is working but yet down here you know there's a lot of instances with our own eyes with our cameras with whatever you know we use whatever evidence it seems like there are kids slipping through those cracks. Well, there have been more than 10,000 car thefts reported in Baltimore so far this year. Last week, BPD revealed about 38% of these thefts were committed by juveniles. The breakdown even more concerning, with about two-thirds of those suspects reported to the Department of Juvenile Services, but only 5% serving time in a DJS facility. And one of those most recent cases reported by police, they say they took seven teens into custody for auto theft. One of those teens had been arrested eight times prior. Reporting live from police headquarters, I'm Shannon Lilly, Fox 45 Morning News. 735 and state lawmakers are facing mounting pressure to scale back a massive increase in education spending known as the blueprint for Maryland's future. As Project Baltimore's Chris Papps explains, the landmark legislation pumps billions into public education, but it's crushing local budgets. We're struggling. We're struggling with Kerwin. Harford County Executive Bob Castley is sounding the alarm, and he's not alone. The news isn't, isn't good. I mean, I cannot deal with a $40 million increase in my education budget next year. At issue is the future of public education in Maryland and how it's funded. In 2021, lawmakers passed the Blueprint for Maryland's Future, also called the Kerwin Plan. The law pumps 30 billion additional tax dollars into public education statewide over the first 10 years, and then 4 billion additional tax dollars every year after that. 
The plan, in part, increases teacher salaries, expands pre-K, and bolsters career and technology training. But when the bill was passed, the legislature did not pass a funding mechanism. In other words, Annapolis approved the largest education spending increase in state history without a way to pay for it. Now, county leaders like Cassidy are saying lawmakers must revisit the plan. There's got to be some, some give and take. There's got to be a, a additional look at this thing, and people need to be a little more rational on how we, how, how we approach this. But uh, to, to throw tax increases in now when the economy is struggling, families are struggling, is the wrong way to go for Maryland and for Harford County. Cassidy is just one of several county executives who have concerns over how the blueprint is being implemented. Earlier this month, the Maryland Association of Counties, or MACO, wrote a letter to Governor Wes Moore, Senate President Bill Ferguson, and Speaker of the House Adrian Jones, asking that the blueprint be adjusted. The letter specifically asks for a more comprehensive cost analysis so counties know exactly how much they have to spend. MAKO also asks for increased state aid to renovate and construct pre-K facilities. When it comes to teacher pay, the letter requests more time to develop educator career ladders, which MAKO calls one of the most unpredictable costs. But these concerns over funding should not come as a surprise. Many predicted this would happen. There are being 95 votes in the affirmative. The blueprint was passed in 2021 when the COVID pandemic was crippling Maryland's economy. Republican Governor Larry Hogan and Democrats, including then Comptroller Peter Francho, warned the legislature not to pass it. It was a bad idea as far as timing, even though we all support education reform. Less than three years after lawmakers passed a blueprint, we're hearing concerns from all over the state, including from the mayor of Baltimore. It was a gut punch. The president of the Carroll County Board of Education. We're struggling. And state senators. Now, I've got counties uh, on the eastern shore that have said for the entire time since Kerwin has been passed that, that they cannot afford it. Whether lawmakers plan to address the financial burdens of Kerwin remain to be seen. But earlier this year, Senate President Bill Ferguson was asked if lawmakers are open to changing the funding formula. We're always back every year, and I think we're always open to make sure if the, if the facts and data are there, we will address it. I think I speak for all of our county executives in saying that, that our people can't, can't deal with the financial impact that the, the Kerwin, as it stands, is placed upon our taxpayers and our citizens. So we've got to make adjustments, and I'm really hoping the General Assembly and make adjustments that are absolutely essential. I'm Chris Pabst, and this is Project Baltimore. Coming up next, convicted killer and disgraced South Carolina attorney Alec Murdoch faces trial once again. The latest on his new case coming up after the break. We are off to a cold start this Tuesday morning. You can see the flurries flying around too. Meteorologist Justin Chambers says everything you can expect this week, including a possible warm up. 739, you're watching Fox 45 Morning News, all local all morning.
742 and happening today, convicted killer, disgraced South Carolina attorney Alec Murdoch will finally face more than a dozen of his other victims today. Let's get right over to Megan Gillen in our live center with what we can expect during today's sentencing. This is now for financial crimes, Megan. Yeah, part two here, guys. Murdoch is expected in court at 10 o'clock this morning after taking a plea deal with prosecutors that will avoid another lengthy trial. On November 17th, Murdoch pled guilty to more than a dozen counts, including money laundering, financial fraud, just to name two, uh, two of them. As part of that deal, prosecutors are recommending 27 years in prison for stealing $8 million in legal settlements he helped his clients win. One victim, Gloria Satterfield, uh, Murdoch's housekeeper, who died after she fell at the family's home in 2018. Murdoch is already serving two life sentences for the murders of his wife and his son, Maggie and Paul. Well, also breaking right now, we want to take you back live to India here this morning. All eyes glued to this screen here, guys. We've been watching a tunnel rescue underway as we speak. The latest, what we know, those rescuers, they were able to drill through the rocks, through the debris here this morning to finally reach the 41 construction workers that have been trapped in a collapsed tunnel there in the Himalayas for 17 days now. We're getting word those workers are set to be pulled out one at a time on wheeled stretchers. And imagine this, guys, through a pipe that's three feet wide down a three-mile long tunnel. You see a lot of action right here. Just about 20 minutes ago, we heard rescuers were, quote, close. Again, this is happening right now. Uh, we're going to keep you posted as soon as we hear more. No word on the conditions of those workers, but as soon as we see anything, anyone coming out of those tunnels, we'll keep you posted. Back to you guys. Coming up, an update in the court case surrounding the murder of a Little Italy restaurant owner. The sentence and more coming up next. And continuing coverage on Maryland's handgun law, the court opinion and the surprising response from Maryland State Police on enforcement. 744, you're watching Fox 25 Morning News. We're all local all morning.
In a city in crisis, nearly two years after a popular Little Italy restaurant manager, Chesley Patterson, was shot dead, the man who admitted to murdering him receives his sentence. Taylor Stewart is joining us live this morning with more on what Samuel Wise is now facing. Taylor? That's right. A Wise is facing 50 years behind bars. Three years of probation after that, he was found guilty and sentenced just this past week. But you recall this case of the popular restaurant manager, Chesley Patterson. He was not far from where he worked when this happened. It happened back in January of 2022, just a few blocks from La Scala. And surveillance video shows what happened there on the corner of Eastern Avenue. As you can see here, he's Patterson's walking to his car. He returns later, and then that van pulls up. That's when the judge determined that Wise hopped out of his car, chose to take Patterson's life, shooting him in the chest that day. And now we're learning more about how people feel in this community. Take a listen. It was someone that uh, everyone liked, and uh, it was sad to hear of the situation. He pleaded guilty. That's great. I'm happy to hear that because he has to pay for what he has done. Look, this new development comes nearly into two years on the anniversary of when this happened in January. Uh, it's, it's a push towards closure for folks living in Little Italy, folks who went to La Scala and continue to frequent La Scala and are remembering Patterson today as this sentence was now handed down. We're live in Baltimore. I'm Taylor Stewart, Fox 45 Morning News. Thank you, Taylor. For more information on the case and our full coverage, you can head over to our website, foxbaltimore.com. 749 now. Let's get over to meteorologist Justin Chambers. I said December 2nd we'd have our first snow, November 28th. I don't know if this is going to count because we're just seeing some flakes that are flying around, at least here. Definitely getting snow in western Maryland. We're going to show you that here in just a second. But this is our Towson camera kind of looking off toward the east and to the north. And you can kind of see some of those low clouds there. We have this little band of snow showers right around from Owings Mills over to Mays Chapel, kind of north of the Beltway, just north of Towson out toward Perry Hall. So probably getting at least to some of those flurries that could be lining up on or at least uh, accumulating just a little bit on your car and possibly on the grassy areas as well. This is our HD radar as we go to the west and this is in Garrett County and we've got some strong snow showers there. In fact, a snow squall warning. This is another one that is now until 815 this morning and this is the area down near Mountain Lake Park over toward Kaiser where we're seeing the potential for some blowing snow and some bursts of heavy snow. I want to take you out there right now from one of our MDOT cameras. Now this doesn't look that bad right now on I-68. But let me tell you, with some of those bursts of snow we're getting over the mountains and that wind that is really picking up, that's the issue that we're going to have and folks there are going to have as well. So just be aware if you have friends or family that live out there or if you're heading west on 68 this morning, you're going to run into that. It's all part of this next weather maker bringing in a little bit of that moisture, a lot of that strong wind. The cold front resides just to the west of us right now. This is the cold front that's going to be moving from west to east as we go throughout the afternoon and that's really going to kick up our wind and really drop our temperatures as well. The current feels like temperatures in the 20s and 30s, but as that wind really picks up later this afternoon and our highs only get to the 30s, you're going to see those wind chill numbers solid teens and 20s for your feels like later this afternoon. It will feel like a January or February day, not late November for sure. And then tomorrow morning, even some leftover wind speed, uh, it, only about 5 to 10 miles an hour, but we're going to have wind chill numbers in the single digits and teens, so that's going to be in that dangerous category for you and as we get the kids out tomorrow morning. Make sure you get that warm cup of joe here as you rise and shine with us next couple of hours. Temperatures are kind of staying right above freezing, so we'll kind of keep the 30s around through most of the day today. 37 by 10 a.m. We'll get to the upper 30s and close to 40 in that 2 and 3 o'clock hour this afternoon. Good news is this thing is pretty much done. After we get through tomorrow, definitely not as windy, but still cold on Wednesday. But notice those temperatures. Mid-50s return Thursday and Friday, even mid to upper 50s as we head toward the weekend. We're hoping to stay dry on Sunday for the mayor's Christmas parade there in Hamden. Back to you. Thank you, Justin. Coming up, you've probably gotten a bag of chips from a vending machine, but how about 100 polio vaccines? Stick around for this exciting holiday giving machine. And it is feeling a lot like Christmas in our studio with our Fox 45 Christmas tree. Stay tuned for a chance to win one of our exciting presents after the break. One of those gifts is a coffee maker.
That'd be nice. Or some coffee this. gift cards. Yes. Another nice gift idea. As long as it has to do with coffee. It's time for a coffee break. It is the season for giving, and these machines right here are making it even easier. 55 giving vending machines are popping up all over the world to celebrate the holiday season and to give back to a good cause. The tradition, now in its seventh year, allows passerbyers to make a purchase, supporting a stranger from around the globe. Three of those machines were unveiled in Times Square yesterday, one coming to Columbia Mall on December 6th, and you're able to give away all kinds of amazing things like sheep and goats to people and school those uniforms, at school yeah. uniforms. It, it's whatever people need in different parts of the world. Yeah, it's great. It, it travel all over the world right there from right from Columbia here coming up in a little bit and that's open until December 31st. Well, it's time to open up a gift here. No vending machine needed. Our countdown to Christmas giveaway. Here we go. We're going to open up this gift and then you call in to win. We had a winner already this morning. Quitina from Catonsville won earlier. All right. Well, let's see what we have in this one. Good things come in small packages, right? And this is this is definitely a, a good thing. Yes, this is uh, a set of Skull Candy True Wireless Earbuds, noise canceling earbuds. They're perfect for the gym. They're perfect for the plane, traveling at the office when you want to, you know, <laughs> get noise canceling on your coworkers. <laughs> You're gonna put no. them in now. <laughs> <laughs> this item is worth 100 bucks. So, well, all right. Uh, yeah, that's a really good one. You can get those at SkullCandy.com. Yeah, in fact, call now because the number, we're about to pop it up on your screen, and it is right there, 410 46, well, we have 469 8308, but that has 481 
8308. So 469 or we'll find out it. 469 8308. There That's the number. Caller 10 right now will get to give bring this gift home and maybe you can regift it or keep it or keep it. Yeah. yeah. Coming up, there may be a couple of snowflakes in the air floating around the wind. Oh, yeah, and it's going to feel <laughs> cold. That's what you need to worry about. Meteorologist Justin Chambers has everything you need to do before you head out and maybe do a dunk contest in Carroll County like Patrice later on. Yeah, not a good day for outside. that. Outside. It, you know, it could be inside a gym. That'd be great. Nope. It's outside. And imagine the Nutcracker with Maryland themes, like, I don't know, Edgar Allan Poe, Old Bay, you know, the Baltimore stuff. We'll tell you about it coming up on Fox 45 Morning News, all local. Well, morning. Live from WBFF in Baltimore, this is Fox 45 Morning News. Here we go. We are seeing a major cool down as your Tuesday gets underway here. You are looking at live pictures from Baltimore to Towson to Western Maryland. And as you can see, it is cold enough that there is snow in Western Maryland. Their schools were delayed this morning. They're coded in snow. We're just seeing the flurries yeah. for now, so that's the good news I'm for us. It. Good morning on this Giving Tuesday, November 28th. I'm Patrice Sanders. I'm Megan Gillen. Mother Nature giving us a lot of cold air and some wind. Meteorologist Justin Chambers here with how it's going to feel. The wind is just beginning, ladies. We're going to see some very strong wind gusts throughout the day today. That's really going to help to drop our temperatures. And then with the wind and the temps combined, we'll see those wind chill numbers that are going to be very cold here and cold feeling as well. Uh, guys, can we go ahead and take weather two, please? Weather two, if you could pull that up. We've got our temperatures here, 19 in Oakland, 29 in Cumberland, mid to upper 30s here for Westminster, Bel Air at 39, uh, 33, excuse me, 39 your temperature currently in Baltimore City. So our temperatures here that we uh, are seeing at this time are going to continue to, well, they'll climb a little bit, but not too much over the uh, next couple of uh, hours. So let me just see what's going on here. There we go. Oh, 
that thing works. All right, cool. Uh, cold Tuesday morning, a blustery day ahead, and then warmer later this week. That's part of our weather story as well. And those numbers are going to get it to the mid to upper 30s here. Today, make sure to get that jacket, but I have the sunglasses ready to go because that sun will be out there. It's just the wind and the cold air that is what we'll have to deal with for later this afternoon. Back with your full forecast. We'll do that in just a few minutes. Talk about how long this winter type weather is hanging around. All right, Justin, thank you. Happening right now, we have been watching a rescue mission happening in northern India after 41 miners were trapped after a collapse. Those workers have been there for more than two weeks now, and rescuers are attempting to finally reach them. We want to get right over to Tom Rogers in our live center with some of the live pictures we're now seeing. Tom, what's going on? Yeah, that's it. In fact, just about 30 minutes ago, we were getting word rescuers were able to break through the last remaining section that was blocking them from the uh, from all those construction workers. There's 41 construction workers who were trapped there. They've been trapped since the collapsed tunnel in the Himalayas for the last 17 days. Workers going to be pulled out through a path made of welded pipes. In fact, you see that screen right over to your right hand side? You can see the tubes. Well, the other one. I was just showing you the other side. That one, yeah, that one. If you look down at the bottom left, right in the corner, that's about the size of the tube that they'll be coming through, about a three foot tube. So that's about the size of them that they'll be moving through. The complex operation has stalled repeatedly because of the challenges drilling through all the rubble. Friday, rescuers resorted to manual digging after the drilling machine broke down. Over the weekend, a drill being used to dig horizontally through the rubble was damaged and the operation temporarily suspended. Authorities have supplied the trapped workers, though, with some hot meals through a six inch pipe. No word yet on how they are doing, though. We'll, of course, keep you posted from the uh, live center right here as soon as anything develops in this story. Also happening right now overseas, we have entered the fifth day of a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. Now, it comes after Qatar said that both Israel and Hamas agreed yesterday to extend the deal for two additional days. Monday's hostage release brought the number of Israelis freed under the truce to 51. 19 additional hostages of other nationalities have also been released. So far, 150 Palestinians have been released from Israeli prisons. 804 and new this hour today marks exactly two years since a 13 year old girl was shot and killed outside of a rec center in West Baltimore and her family will be pushing for justice. We are talking about Malia Turner. The teen was shot and killed outside the Lillian Jones Recreation Center in Sandtown. Her killer still has not been found this afternoon. Her family will be speaking about the case and about why they say Mayor Scott BPD and prosecutors have let them down. Here's her picture, excuse me, this is her mother speaking with Fox 45 after her granddaughter was killed. I don't know what she was feeling, you know what I'm saying? She probably was scared, you know, all that stuff running through my mind. And when you can't save your child, oh my God. There is a $16,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. The news conference is happening at 12.30 outside the Lillian Jones Rec Center. Fox 45 News will be there. We will have live coverage for you. And today at 12.30, family spokesperson and former deputy attorney Theru Vignaraja uh, will address the media at the Lillian Jones Rec Center, along with many of the victims' loved ones who are going to be there to support the family and uh, support calls for justice for Malia. Now, this morning, an investigation is underway after a seven-year-old was found with a gun in his backpack last week at a Baltimore school. It happened at the Creative City Charter School in Park Heights. We're told that a member of the school staff received an anonymous tip about the gun, which led to the seizure. Sources tell us the student is being transferred to an alternative school, but because of recent changes to the state's juvenile justice laws, accountability for that child will be limited. It may be show and tell until somebody confronts them. And I do believe push comes to shove when it comes down to they wouldn't hesitate to shoot somebody. They have no fear. They have, there's no consequence. Police, prosecutors have all been complaining about juvenile crime for months, calling for accountability for young people. Today, the Baltimore City delegation is holding their fourth annual pre-session hearing. Everyone is welcome to speak up uh, and give their insights about how to solve the problem and make improvements in this city. The meeting is virtual. It will be held from 6 to 8 tonight.
Another lawmaker is calling for patience, saying that these juvenile crime laws have not been in place long enough to see their impact. This morning we have Taylor Stewart. She's joining us live with why a county state's attorney and state delegates say we cannot afford to wait. Taylor. Right now that is an abatement trees. It's really just a handful of juvenile justice reform laws passed in the last year. But now another person coming to the forefront here, John McCarthy, he's the state attorney in Montgomery County, and he's getting specific about the changes he wants to see. We're talking about the laws we've been talking about for a while now, the one that prevents 13-year-old children from being uh, get, facing misdemeanor charges as well for nonviolent crimes, as well as the other uh, act that has now prevented police from questioning juveniles without the presence of an attorney and parental permission. However, at this point, it seems that Senator Will Smith, who chairs the Senate Judiciary Proceeding Committee, is not on board. He indicated that he's just not full for a full repeal of this law, but he says juvenile justice laws will be put in place are going to take a couple of years uh, to fully see the kind of the fruit uh, of the foundations that we've laid and the seeds that we've planted. I, for one, am not interested in rolling back uh, the reforms that we put in place last year. We've got to look at services. We've got to look at options. We've got to look at more flexibility for probation. Now, at this point, we know that McCarthy says he understands that the idea behind this plan and agrees a full repeal might not be necessary. But specifically, he wants to see changes to felonies and how uh, prohibitionary limits are addressed, as well as bring some faith and discretion back to judges. We're going to follow this as it develops here in Baltimore. Taylor Stewart, Fox 45 News. That brings us to our question of the day. Do you want your elected leaders to hold young kids accountable? So far, 99% of people who voted say yes. To make your voice heard, head to foxbaltimore.com slash vote. Eric Chauvin's attorney speaking out for the first time since he was stabbed in person. Coming up, when the family was made aware of the prisoner's injuries. The man convicted of killing a Little Italy restaurant owner receives decades behind bars. Still ahead, Fox 45 News shares the outpouring of support for Patterson nearly two years after his death. The wind and the cold, that is what we're talking about today. And those blustery conditions will continue into the afternoon. We'll talk about if you've got a really cold week ahead and if we've got some warmer numbers on the way.
New this morning, the attorney for Derek Chauvin, the ex-police officer convicted of killing George Floyd, is speaking out after Chauvin was stabbed in prison. Chauvin was stabbed at the Federal Correctional Institution in Tucson, Arizona. This happened last week. He is said to be in stable condition. Despite his severe injuries, Chauvin's attorney claims that he nor any of Chauvin's family were informed until hours later. By reaching out to the to the Tucson prison on not less than seven occasions, no one has contacted us directly. Uh, and as of 48 hours after the stabbing, no one had contacted the family. Well, according to the attorney, he and Chauvin's family were only made aware of the attack when news outlets reported the stabbing. Chauvin is serving a 22 year sentence for Floyd's death. County leaders criticizing the cost of Maryland's blueprint for education. In our next half hour, Project Baltimore looks, in, looks into those complaints and the impact that it could have on you, the taxpayer. A Maryland law is overturned, making it easier for people to legally get a gun. The effect this ruling could have on other gun laws in Maryland. 813, you're watching Fox 45 Morning News, all local, all morning. Maryland State Police issuing this agency-wide order to continue enforcing Maryland's handgun qualification law. This despite a scathing court opinion calling the law unconstitutional. This morning, law enforcement expert Mari Richards joining us live to weigh in. Mari, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Megan. Good morning. So what does this law mean for us, for our viewers? Well, what the law should mean uh, is that uh, law-abiding citizens should not be denied the right of uh, self-defense, you know, possessing a handgun. Uh, the fact that the state police are not honoring the decision uh, really shows the radical agenda of Governor Moore, uh, Mayor Scott, and the entire Democratic legislature, they've constantly protected criminals and ignored victims. 
And Mari, not... I, I want to break in and ask you, you know, you have a law enforcement background here, chief of police in, in Morgantown, West Virginia. You understand how this works and, of course, how policing is done. Why would Maryland State Police issue this? Can you try to see the other side? Is there another side? There really is no other legitimate side. They say that it's going to stop crime, but if you look at all the shootings from this year all the way back, eight years of Marilyn Mosby, about 10,000 homicides and shootings. Uh, you know, I've thought about it, Megan. I can't remember one that was committed by a legal gun owner. So this does not prevent crime. It only um, gets more victims. So uh, just last week in Canton, you had a woman and her babies in a home invasion. She has to barricade a bedroom door and the police don't get there for an hour. She needed a gun in that house to protect herself. What is the answer here, Mari? How do we get criminals from not having these guns? What, what do we do? Well, it starts by uh, supporting laws that punish criminals. Once again, in the legislature, uh, you know, making uh, stealing a gun a felony, uh, you know, having uh, uh, stronger penalties on repeat offenders, these are things that the governor and the Democrats oppose, um, not to mention the juvenile justice system that lets juveniles commit crimes without accountability. So you start there, and uh, unless you can do that, uh, you're going to have trouble. And right. that doesn't even get to the point of BPD being 700 officers short. Sure. So people need to be able to protect themselves because the police aren't there to do it. That's unfortunate. Mari, thank you for weighing in. We appreciate it. Thank you, Megan. It is 819 now, and we need to get another check of, or do we? I mean, it's cold, we it's to. windy, it's blustery, it's all the time you don't want to be outside. Something I'm, about it's exciting, though. This is the time of year. I'm thinking those cups on the desk need to go to holiday. I mean, oh, you're right. right? You know what I mean? Sure. Like, because it's December. like, December this is a holiday. First. Oh, we have to wait till December? Oh. I don't know. I've just two saying, more days. Maybe if you look closely at this shot, I mean, that sun is kind of really bright in the Towson camera, but we did have a few of those flakes that were kind of blowing around. Some of you maybe a light little coating on the car this morning or the car window. Oh, see, so you have to hit switch this back over. Here. OK, cool. My new, my new clicker. Let's see if that, well, it works, good. All right, here's our HD radar. So not really seeing much in the way of actual snow here in Baltimore proper, the county right around Towson out to Perry Hall and White Marsh. A couple of those uh, snow showers are possible. Really where we're getting actual snow is here in Western Maryland. Let me pull up that shot if we can. Thank you guys in the back. This is right there at I-68 at the West Virginia line. And yeah, a few trucks out there, a car or two, but yeah, the snow continues to fall. Earlier, just in the last hour, we had a snow squall warning. That was allowed to expire, but now this purple area for Garrett County under a winter weather advisory. This now goes until 4 o'clock this afternoon, and this is where we've seen that snow accumulate in western Maryland, all part of this larger weather maker that is bringing the cold air, just enough moisture to get some of that snow that is going to be falling and that we're seeing fall, and we saw a little bit of that here in central Maryland, but it's all along this cold front. That's the frontal boundary right there. This guy is going to be moving from west to east across our region as we head into the afternoon. What that's going to do? Wind is going to pick up significantly. It's already breezy out there, but we're looking at 25 to 30 mile an hour gusts as we head into the day, the westerly and northwesterly wind. And then what that's going to do, the temperatures, even though we're going to only get to the upper 30s, which is cold as it is, but we're going to feel like teens and 20s for your afternoon. And tomorrow morning, we have the potential for some dangerous wind chills where it's going to feel like single digits and teens for a lot of you waking up. So make sure to kind of think ahead for that and make sure those kids 
kids are planned out or the days are planned out so the kids have plenty of warm clothes. 36 your temp right now. We're seeing those temperatures that will climb only to about 39 by noontime. Some of us will get close to 40 degrees, but you just saw that wind chill map. It's going to feel a lot colder than that throughout the afternoon today. So temperatures across Carroll and Baltimore counties, mainly in the low to mid and upper 30s, a few lower 40s here and there, well below average this time of year. Even our friends in the eastern shore, Chestertown, Centerville, down through Easton and Chester, right in the upper upper 30s for your highs for today. It's short lived. Tomorrow we're still going to be cold, a lot less wind on Wednesday, but we're going to wake up in the 20s tomorrow morning. So it's going to be way colder than it is right now. And then as we head into Thursday and Friday, right back into the mid 50s, our next chance for rain comes on Friday afternoon, Saturday and Sunday right now looking dry. But look at those temperatures, guys, back to the mid to upper 50s. The Ravens can rest up following Sunday's big win over the LA Chargers. How the coaching staff is making sure players make the most of the upcoming bye week. It's the Nutcracker with the Maryland Twist. We'll tell you all about it coming up on Fox 45 Morning News. All local, all morning long. Dance spans generations, and you can catch all the shows this season at the Ballet and Body. Mark Clark is live alongside the dancers with how they're preparing for all these performances. Mark. That's right. So we're with Emily, and Emily, it's a professional production, but the students are also incorporated, right? Yes. Yeah, so Ballet and Body was founded in 2019. We have 13 professional dancers in our production, and then we also have um, seven in our student company. So they are student ages uh, 11 to 18. They have auditioned for this production um, to be a part of the Ballet and Body student company, and they get to rehearse and learn alongside the professionals. It's a great opportunity for them to see what the professional expectations 
expectations are like in a ballet company. Right here you can see our students and our professional principal dancers mm -hmm. all dancing together. And yeah. so Emily, when, how can people get tickets? When is it? What are the dates? We got to come see this. It's yes, amazing. you have to. So December 9th and 10th at Carroll Community College. Um, if you go to themarylandnutcracker.com, you can get tickets really easily at themarylandnutcracker.com. It just feels like the holidays and, and, and Mark with the flair. Like you could be a performer too, Mark. Just like that. More information's on our website, foxbaltimore.com slash newslinks. Millie, Maryland lottery players are cashing in on some big prizes, but one prize remains unclaimed. Where and how much that one unclaimed ticket is coming from? We are cold this morning with some areas near freezing still ahead when we can expect warmer temperatures. It's 827 on Fox 45 Morning News, all local, all morning. Live from WBFF in Baltimore, this is Fox 45 Morning News. Oh yeah, not bad at all. Looking at your Fox 45 Christmas tree and it's feeling a lot like Christmas in our studio. Still up for grabs, lottery tree tickets to see Mrs. Doubtfire at the Hippodrome, tons of toys. Uh, we are done handing out our gift for today, but stick around tomorrow as you have another chance, multiple chances, to win some of the special gifts under the tree. And the next day and the next day through Christmas Eve. Thanks for waking up with us on this Tuesday, November 28th. I'm Megan Gilland. I'm Tom Rogers, and we want to find out exactly it does feel like Christmas. <laughs> In fact, if Christmas was today, you may be able to say it's a white Christmas, kind of. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I mean, 27 days away from Christmas. Uh, folks in Western Maryland are like, yeah, hey, it would yeah. be a white Christmas for sure. It's a white 
Giving Tuesday. It's a white National French Toast Day. Maybe that. Here's a look outside right now. Uh, as zoomed into the stadium, of course, as uh, the Ravens will be back there coming up, not this Sunday, but next Sunday right here on Fox 45. They play the other team from L.A. So 39, your number right now in Baltimore City, 38 in Dundalk, 37 Brooklyn Park and Glen Burnie. Overall, our temperatures, well, they're not going to do much today. Climb into the upper 30s and close to 40 into that uh, 2 and 3 o'clock hour. But the wind, west and northwest, 15 to 30 miles an hour, some strong gusts that will be possible so it's not going to feel like 30s it'll feel more like more like teens and 20s kind of a raw afternoon 42 tomorrow not nearly as windy but we're right back to the 50s on Thursday so we do have some improvement coming in the next couple of days just got to get through this day back with your full forecast we'll do that and we'll track some rain as well coming up in a few all right any issues on the roads at least locally here Tom yeah locally in our Lynn Stoller traffic network we do have some major incidents there's one it is uh, south on 95 right at O'Donnell Street there's an incident and there's a collision there and it's causing some backup southbound right around that curve if you're familiar with that big uh, S curve over there in the uh, area and now we also have in Kearney just the volume that is there and then there's believe it or not there's some debris on the inner loop actually I believe that's the outer loop at 695 right at Northwest Expressway and that's causing some backup so something fell off a truck and they haven't cleaned it up yet and that's causing a couple lane closures there so that's backing you up even though the construction zone is ahead of you so you still have some fun times if you're on your morning commute. In a city in crisis, BPD tells us four teenagers robbed a man and assaulted him at gunpoint right near Patterson Park last Wednesday in the Southeast District. All four were arrested and in the Eastern District that same day, Fox truck tracking down two teens who stole a car. Police say they then recovered drugs and a stolen gun when they arrested the suspects. Shannon Lilly is joining us live from Baltimore Police Department's headquarters with a look at the more recent examples of juveniles accused of committing crimes. Shannon. Yeah, and we're taking a look at some of the latest Baltimore police data, Tom and Megan. And what we're finding is that 15 juveniles have been arrested for various crimes around the city since last Wednesday. And for many of these juveniles, this isn't their first or even their second arrest. The victim is claiming that the four juveniles, um, high schoolers, dressing all black, uh, went towards the park. They utilize a handgun. That's the dispatch on the eve of Thanksgiving as police were called to Baltimore's Patterson Park after a victim says they were robbed at gunpoint by a group of juveniles. Just days later, a rash of armed robberies hit the Pigtown area. The majority of the suspects there, we're told, were also juveniles. If BPD says, well, we're arresting them, and you see that, you know, on the report that, you know, that they're, or at least they were in custody and they were taken downtown, so you know that, uh, DJS says that you know we're giving them services and look at our chart and here's how great this is working but yet down here you know there's a lot of instances with our own eyes with our cameras with whatever you know we use whatever evidence it seems like there are kids slipping through those cracks now, there have been more than 10,000 car thefts reported in Baltimore so far this year. Last week, BPD revealed about 38% of these thefts were committed by juveniles. The breakdown is even more concerning, with about two-thirds of those suspects reported to the Department of Juvenile Services, but only 5% serving time in a DJS facility. And one of those most recent arrest cases that police are telling us about, they say they uh, detained seven juveniles, took them into custody for auto theft and one of those juveniles had already been arrested eight times prior reporting live from police headquarters i'm shannon lily fox 45 morning news all right shannon thank you fox 45 news continues to follow the juvenile crime crisis across maryland police prosecutors and parents they are all joining the calls to change the juvenile justice laws that they say keep authorities from holding young people accountable. Earlier this morning, Delegate Kathy Schlega from Baltimore County joined us to weigh in on what needs to change when it comes to the current juvenile justice laws in Maryland. Spend more time coddling criminals than protecting victims. Um, the juvenile situation is at a crisis. Well, you can watch the rest of this interview on our website, foxbaltimore.com. 
836, state lawmakers are facing mounting pressure to scale back a massive increase in education spending known as the blueprint for Maryland's future. That's right. Project Baltimore's Chris Papps joining us live this morning to explain more about this landmark legislation really pumping billions into public education. Chris, good morning. What's it doing to local budgets? I go yeah, well, it's doing a lot to local budgets, and we're seeing it all around the state now, from the mayor of Baltimore to the various uh, 23 counties in the state that are that are saying, listen, we, we understand that the state legislature wanted to change how public schools are funded and wanted to, to make changes to the public education system. And this was the blueprint for Maryland's f uh, future, also known as the Kerwin Plan, initially passed in 2020 after COVID shut down the state. Repe or, um, vetoed by Governor Hogan, and that in 2021, when the state was still largely shut down, the state legislature, mostly along party lines, Democrats for, Republicans against it, overrode Governor Larry Hogan's veto and passed it anyway. So the largest education spending increase in Maryland's history, and there was no funding mechanism billions of additional dollars going towards public education. The legislature didn't put in a funding mechanism and they passed it when the state was shut down because of COVID. Well, shocker, not even three years later, there's not enough money to pay for it because of all those things that we just mentioned. So the, the county legislature's MACO, which is the Maryland uh, Association of Counties, wrote a letter to Governor Wes Moore, the Senate President, and the Speaker of the House saying, listen, can we please revisit this? There is simply not enough money to pay for it. What can we change moving forward to still make some needed adjustments in public education, but not bankrupt the counties, or the, the counties are going to have to take money away from other places that are vital to people to be able to fund public education. So the, in the next couple of months, there's gonna be a lot going on in Maryland. The legislature convenes obviously in January, it runs through April. You know, what are they going to do with Kerwin? Because right now, the executives that run the counties are saying this is simply not going to work. Chris Pabs, thank you. We look forward to the continued stories here. We are following two breaking news stories this morning. War pause, extension between Israel and Hamas, and a tunnel rescue that's underway right now for trapped construction workers in India. I'm taking you live to both spots. Temperatures will be in the 30s, may just get to the 40s for the afternoon. Meteorologist Justin Chambers letting us know how long the cold conditions are going to last. 838, you're watching Fox 45 Morning News, all local, all morning.
Israel and Hamas now agreeing to extend the war pause for an additional two days. And today we know there is a possibility that more hostages could be freed. We're taking you live here to Gaza. You can still see smoke filling the sky right there. So far during this war pause, there have been the release of 150 Palestinians detained for criminal offenses and also the freedom of 69 Hamas held hostages. It's a fraction of the 240 that were kidnapped in the October 7th massacre, many who are still being held captive here in Gaza. But this morning, families of those freed are reuniting and rejoicing. Take a look at this video here just released by the Israeli military showing the moment those hostages crossed the border into Israel yesterday to freedom after more than 50 days of being held captive by Hamas in Gaza. Taking you live now to the White House, where the Biden administration is still holding out hope that two more Americans will be released during this extended two-day truce. We know Hamas has agreed to release 20 people in total over the next several days. We also know today U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will be visiting Israel for his third trip since the start of the war. Also breaking right now, um, do we have that live shot? I don't think we've got this live shot here, but we had been watching uh, India where a tunnel rescue is underway as we speak. We know rescuers were able to drill through rocks and debris this morning to finally reach the 41 construction workers that have been trapped in a collapsed tunnel in the Himalayas for the last 17 days. Getting word those workers are said to be pulled out one at a time on wheeled stretchers through a pipe three feet wide down a three mile long tunnel. Again, it's happening right now. No word yet on how they're doing. We know that they have been getting food, water, light, oxygen, medicine through the pipe, but there's been a series of snags with machines and getting them out till now. We'll keep you posted as we learn more. Some good news when it comes to holiday spending. Prices at the pump are not adding to your burden. Still ahead, how much money you can save when you hit the roads this holiday season. But first, winter isn't officially here. It sure feels like it this morning. After the break, some tips to help you prepare your home for the winter weather.
The winter season doesn't start until December 21st, but this morning we are waking up to a bit of a, a blast of wintry weather. Yeah, the temperatures dip to the mid-20s in many areas. The wind chill making it even feel colder. John Gonzalez from our Sinclair sister station has some tips to help you prepare your home for the winter weather. John. Well, it's that time of year. Temperatures are dropping. These mornings are getting colder and colder, and we're making sure that you are avoiding a freeze emergency, if you will, trying to avoid spending a lot of money on repairs right off the bat, winterizing your home. You want to make sure your gutters are clean. We've got the ladder up. Want to make sure there's no debris leaves up there because that will collect water. It could freeze and potentially leak into your home. And speaking of leaking, you want to make sure you shut off your water source to your spigot out here. Disconnect your hose. That could also create a freeze problem this winter. Move over to the car here. We've got the battery under the hood, but this morning, one thing you can really check real quick is the windshield wiper blades. Make sure that the rubber's not coming off. It's not peeling. Looks pretty good there. And then you've got the tires. Make sure you've got plenty of air. First of all, good air pressure is important during these winter months. But the tread, you want to make sure you check all the tread channels. Make sure your fingers can really fit in there. You've got deep space there and you've got a good tire. Now, I spoke to Jeff Phillips with Spikes Auto Care and Tire, and he tells us about a little Coca-Cola trick under the hood. We get these cold mornings and you go to start your car and it sounds kind of slow and cranks over kind of slow. Pop your hood, take a look at your battery. In this case, we got a nice new battery. As you can see, it's nice and clean. Um, there's no corrosion on the terminals. Um, there's also no acid leaking out of the battery. Um, if you do have corrosion, sit a nice helpful hint. Take a can of Coca-Cola and dump a little bit on the terminals or heat up a cup of water in the microwave and you can clean off that corrosion. And now is a perfect time to make sure with all the Christmas lights and space heaters being plugged in to check your smoke detectors. Make sure you got good batteries and a good detector. And with all the layers of clothing we're going to be wearing over the next couple months and blankets, good idea to change the filter of your HVAC. You've got all that lint and dust build up there. So it's time to winterize your home and your vehicles. The winter months are arriving. Back to you inside. That was good. We might need to hire John to come help yes, us out we here. Just do it. He just did a run through at his house. We could just have him <laughs> just go around. Just that pay him for that. Good. All right. Meteorologist Justin Chambers is here and, and we need these tips right now. We're that, heading into that. That was really interesting about the air filter. I didn't even think yeah. about that because, yeah, you know, maybe changing that out for uh, the uh, new season. You're cranking up the heater for sure today and especially tonight into tomorrow morning as we're going to have some of the coldest temperatures we've had since February of this year. Definitely the coldest of the season. Right now, you look at this shot and you're like, Oh, it's nice, nice, beautiful, sunny day, right? Yeah, with some flakes that have been flying around and some of those clouds that are hanging around as well on our HD radar. Not picking up actual snowfall, but we did have a little bit in Baltimore City and County earlier. Where we are seeing actual snow is in western Maryland, just to the south of Hagerstown, over toward Martinsburg, West Virginia, and continuing out toward the west, especially on uh, I-68. That's where we're seeing some of the biggest issues out there. That purple in Garrett County is now a winter weather advisory, which the National Weather Service posted just a little while ago. This now goes until 4 o'clock this afternoon, as we'll have that potential for some blowing snow and additional accumulations. It's all part of this weather maker here where we're seeing some wind advisories down to the south, the kind of the backside or the spine of the Appalachians, and all of that wind is going to be heading in our direction. We're already seeing the wind pick up, but once this cold front moves a little bit closer to us and crosses from west to east this afternoon, that's when those wind speeds are going to increase. Temperatures are going to drop and the feels like temperatures will not be fun to be outside. So we're talking about low to mid 20s and 30s in terms of miles per hour for your peak wind gusts for the afternoon. The wind stays with us through most of the afternoon into the evening. will die down a bit through the overnight hours and shouldn't be as much of an issue for tomorrow. But what we have to watch for today, these are the feels like temperatures. I've been showing this all morning. So teens and 20s, that's what it's going to feel like today. And then tomorrow morning, we're going to wake up with teens and some single digit wind chills, especially for you up in Westminster, uh, parts of northern Baltimore County, northern Hartford County. A lot of us in the widespread teens for the feels like number as you get out and early on your Wednesday. Now, Hank the bird. Good morning, Hank. <laughs> Yeah, he's a little bit cold, needs to uh, try to find a place to stay warm. We're only going to get to the upper 30s and some of us to about 40 degrees in Baltimore City. Notice most of us will be in the mid to upper 30s. Eastern shore across the Chesapeake up into Westminster, barely above freezing here. And this 
cold air continues up and down the East Coast from New York and Philly down through Baltimore and D.C. as that Arctic air is moving in. We're still cold tomorrow, not nearly as windy, but those temperatures moderate nicely. Thursday and Friday, we're right back to the mid-50s and mid to upper 50s as we head into this upcoming weekend. We are tracking another weather maker that's going to bring some wet weather to the region, so thankfully that's not here today. You can see tomorrow a little bit of cloud cover. Thursday, we tap into the southerly flow. That brings in the warmer air. But then here comes our next weather maker. Friday morning. We'll start with some showers early and then off and on showers through most of Friday afternoon into the evening time. It'll kind of be a steady light rain that we'll see, but that's going to bring us our wet weather. And that's the first day of December, by the way, guys. The meteorological winter first day is December 1st, and that's Friday. However, mid to upper 50s, so it won't feel like winter this weekend with those numbers climbing. Hopefully, we'll get that uh, dry weather for the mayor's Christmas parade coming up in Hamden on Sunday, right? Oh, yeah, Sunday afternoon. Sounds good. Thank you, Justin. Take the rest of the week off. Yeah, that's the best Victory Monday news for any NFL team heading into the bye week. Head coach John Harbaugh giving his first place Ravens the week off before they get back to work next week for one of their toughest five game stretches to end the regular season. The break is much needed for the Ravens after a tough fought Sunday night game against the inconsistent and desperate Chargers team. The Ravens offense sure kept L.A. really in the game, but the defense shut the door. Ravens win it 20 to 10. Now they improve the Ravens to nine and three for the record number one in the AFC right now. When the Ravens do return next week for practice, they'll start prepping for their toughest five game stretch. Week 14 at home against the Rams. After that, all teams either first or second in their division. At the Jaguars Sunday night in week 15, Christmas primetime game, Monday night football at the 49ers. Miami comes here New Year's Eve. Then they end their regular season week 18 hosting Pittsburgh. Trending this morning, a mega multiplier fast play ticket worth $100,000 remains unclaimed as of this morning. The ticket was purchased over Thanksgiving weekend in Sykesville. It was Maryland's top prize of the past week. Three other players won $50,000, two won on scratch offs, the other won on the daily bonus match five game. Winners of prizes larger than $25 must redeem their tickets at the Maryland Lottery Claim Center in Baltimore, which is open by appointment only. The numbers are in. U.S. consumers literally broke the bank over the Thanksgiving holiday weekend. Coming up, how much consumers spent online during Black Friday? Imagine the Nutcracker with a Maryland twist. Edgar Allan Poe, I don't know, some crabs, some, I don't know, you know, some <laughs> Maryland ideas. Well, that's happening. We'll tell you when and where. Coming up on Fox 45 Morning News, all local, all morning long. I don't think of any dance moves. Cur curtsy is not a ballet move. That's the only thing I could come up with. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, pure, I forget what it's called. But I was thinking when he started saying about the Nutcracker and making it Maryland, you're thinking, okay, Old Bay on the rim of your coffee cup, and then you use almond juice, right? Or almond milk, because it's the nuts. We need a coffee break. Let's yeah, think definitely. about this some more. We'll keep, put a pin in that. What is it called?
In your morning business report, the numbers are in and U.S. consumers literally broke the bank over the Thanksgiving holiday weekend. Get this, consumers spent nearly $10 billion online just this Black Friday. That is according to Adobe Analytics. Despite three years of high inflation, spending is bouncing to pre-pandemic levels. The Black Friday period that we just experienced was one where the consumer was out and about and spending, certainly still very focused on those promotions. Well, analysts also predict consumers could spend a record $113 billion this holiday season. That's a nearly 14% hike from the year before. Some good news when it comes to holiday spending. Prices at the pump are not adding to your burden. The price of gas has been falling for 60 consecutive days, according to AAA. The current national average for a regular gallon of gas is down 27 cents from a month ago to $3.25 per gallon time for today's America Steals and Deals. The following segment is sponsored by Naki. There is nothing more frustrating than when you want to take a photo and your phone says storage full Ugh. and it always happens at the most inconvenient times. I was just at my godson's wedding and I took hundreds of photos. If I had had the Click Free Pro, I would have loaded them onto this and gifted him one of these as a keepsake of his special day. And the Click Free Pro can store thousands of photos and videos while fitting easily in your hand. You know, other storage options are they're bulky, they're expensive, and sometimes you need other accessories to it with different devices. Well, this has a port. Look at this. Look how easily that went in for each device. So you can use it with your laptop or your tablet. It's light and it's a great deal. The Click Free app, this is really cool allows you to scan old photos so they don't sit on a shelf or a box anymore. And also, this is really cool. I love this little carrying case. It's cute. They come in lots of different colors. Just perfect. Right now, we are offering 50% off. Did you hear what I said? Get this, 50% off on the Click Free Pro. So I want you to head over to asadeals.com for this exclusive offer. And believe me, these are going to go very, very quickly. A child found with a gun in his backpack at a Baltimore City school. Coming up, we'll tell you just how shockingly young sources say this child is, and we'll hear from a parent who says their child witnessed it. And we're talking about temperatures that are cold right now. The wind is blowing around, too. It's only going to pick up as the day goes on. We'll break it down for you. Good Day Baltimore starts right now. Live from WBFF in Baltimore, this is Fox 45 Good Day Baltimore. Good morning on this Tuesday, November 28th. I'm Patrice Sanders. I'm Megan Gillen. We've got meteorologist Justin Chambers here. He's got to look at our cold forecast. Yeah, we had some snow flurries around the area this morning. Definitely getting that snow in western Maryland. If you're headed that direction all morning long, we've been showing you those uh, shots out there. We have winter weather advisories from parts of Garrett County. It's kind of hard to see on this shot, but I know it and I picked it out. That Bromo Seltzer Tower clock is correct. So they have now fallen back. About a month into it, but either way, it's all good. Uh, our wind gusts right now, guys, we're talking about 19 to 25 miles an hour from Easton over to Westminster. 24 mile an hour wind gusts just reported in Frederick. So look at the feels like temperatures already. Even though we're in the upper 30s right now, it feels like we're below freezing and most of us feel like the 20s. And that's going to be the case through the day today. A blustery kind of raw afternoon, very winter like day, even though we still are in fall. Upper 30s here and lower 40s over the next couple of hours. We'll take you through your hour by hour forecast and let you know exactly what to expect as we head into this upcoming week and the first weekend of December as well in just a few. We've heard, heard about things around here like that, but I never would expect to have an, an actual elementary school around here. Like that's a little crazy. I think this issue particularly has gotten so bad that everybody started to feel it in their, in their own communities um, that, that they're going to be on the same page largely. It's really at a boiling point for us. This morning, Fox 45 News is following two big stories surrounding the juvenile crime crisis here in Maryland. 
Calls for more action from legislators are growing after new data from the Baltimore Police Department highlights a violent holiday weekend in the city. Those juvenile crime concerns extend to Pigtown, where police say a majority of suspects in a recent string of robberies are juveniles. Sources also tell us a seven-year-old was found with a gun in his backpack last week at a Baltimore school. This morning, parents are concerned. This morning, we have team coverage when it comes to demanding answers to the juvenile crime crisis. In a few minutes, Taylor Stewart will be live with how Fox 45 News is pressing lawmakers on the state's juvenile justice laws. But we begin with Shannon Lilly. She is live from Baltimore Police Headquarters with why those laws could be impacting the investigation into the seven-year-old accused of bringing that gun. Shannon. Well, because of the child's age, Patrice, juvenile reform laws prohibit officers from charging the child or even questioning him. Now, police have yet to indicate whether they know who owns the gun, but sources confirmed to us that it was found in the backpack of a seven-year-old. Now, this all unfolding at the Creative City Charter School in Park Heights. And in a statement, police describe what happened, writing, quote, a member of the school staff received an anonymous tip regarding a student possessing a weapon concealed in their backpack. The staff member proceeded to inspect the backpack and visually confirmed the presence of the weapon. This weapon was removed and officers were notified. Now we spoke with a parent, Kendra Nelson. She says her seven year old watched as teachers discovered the weapon. He actually saw uh, the gun that the child had in class. I would say the child obviously got it from an adult. So where's the conversation being had with the adults in that child's life? Now, in a letter to parents, school administrators say the student was detained and will be addressed. They also encourage parents to talk to your child about safety and monitor what your child brings to school. But because of juvenile reform laws, retired city police officer Daryl Burham says police action is now severely limited even when guns are found in schools. It may be show and tell until somebody confronts them. And I do believe push comes to shove when it comes down to they wouldn't hesitate to shoot somebody. They have no fear. They have, there's no consequence. Well, sources tell us that student is being transferred to an alternative school. As for police, they have not yet said whether they will be pursuing the owner or owners of the gun. Reporting live, I'm Shannon Lilly, Fox 45 News. Good day, Baltimore. Thank you, Shannon. This incident is just the latest, leading to questions about Maryland's juvenile justice laws. Earlier this month, a 12 and 14 year old caught on camera allegedly beating a woman trying to steal her cards in Butcher's Hill. You see it there. They were released after a few hours following a call from DJS to Baltimore police. In Montgomery County, a 12 year old was accused of making seven school threats in a three week period in October. He allegedly told police that he knew he wouldn't face charges because of the state's laws. Parents, police and prosecutors have been complaining about juvenile crime for months, calling for accountability for young people. Today, the Baltimore City delegation is holding their fourth annual pre session hearing. Anyone and everyone is welcome to speak up and share their insights on how to make improvements in the city. That meeting is virtual and will be held from 6 to 8 tonight. Now, the meeting comes on the heels of another uh, state delegate voicing the need for lawmakers to take action. State delegate Nino Mangione says something needs to be done. As an elected official, number one priority, an obligation to push policies that result in more public safety. And there's no better message to send to potential would-be juvenile criminals than prepare to pay the price. You're no longer getting away with it. Another lawmaker is calling for patience, saying these juvenile crime laws haven't been in place long enough to see their impact. Taylor Stewart joins us live with why a county state's attorney and state delegates say we just cannot afford to wait. Taylor. It really comes down to just a handful of changes they want to see. When it comes to juvenile justice reform, one of the latest voices really spearheading this movement right now, Montgomery County State Attorney John McCarthy, who's getting specific about the changes he says he wants to see. 
Keep in mind here, we're talking about these two laws and questions prosecutors across our state have been voicing concern about. One of them prevents uh, children 13 years old and younger from facing criminal charges for even misdemeanor offenses in violent in cases that are nonviolent and deemed so by the state. The other one prevents police from questioning juveniles without the presence of an attorney and a parent's permission. Now, at this point, we do know that the leader of the Judicial Proceedings Committee, Senator Will Smith, he says he is not on board with making changes to the law. He thinks that we need to see more time pass before we can make any real adjustments. Take a listen to this back and forth. We put it in place. We're going to take a couple of years uh, to fully see the kind of the fruit uh, of the foundations that we've laid and the seeds that we've planted. I, for one, am not interested in rolling back. Uh, the reforms that we put in place last year. We've got to look at services. We've got to look at options. We've got to look at more flexibility for probation. Now, McCarthy says he understands the idea behind these plans and, and agrees a, a full repeal may not be necessary, but he says there are specific changes he'd like to see made, like reviewing all felonies that impact juveniles, addressing some of the probationary limits, and giving some faith and discretion back to judges. Again, that House Judiciary Committee meeting again meets next Tuesday, so we're going to stay on that as well. Happening today, exactly two years since a 13-year-old girl was shot and killed outside of a rec center in West Baltimore, her family will be pushing for justice. We are talking about Malia Turner. The teen was shot and killed outside the Lillian Jones Recreation Center in Sandtown. Her killer still has not been found. This afternoon, her family will be speaking about the case and about why they say Mayor Scott, BPD, and prosecutors have let them down. Here is her mother speaking with Fox 45 after her daughter was killed. I don't know what she was feeling. You know what I'm saying? She probably was scared. You know, all that stuff running through my mind. And when you can't save your child, oh my God. There is a $16,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. The news conference is happening at 1230 outside the Lillian Jones Rec Center. Fox 45 News will be there and will have live coverage for you. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is heading to Israel today to push for an extended pause in fighting. National correspondent Kayla Gaskin joins us live from Capitol Hill. And Kayla, part of his mission is to get more hostages released. Is that right? Yes, and specifically American hostages. Now, we saw Hamas release the first American hostage yesterday, four-year-old Abigail Eden. The White House said yesterday that Hamas is holding nine more Americans. Israel and Hamas did agree to extend the current pause in fighting, and this allows more time for additional hostages to be released. We expect 10 more to be released today. Qatar mm -hmm. guarantees 20 more hostages by, being held by Hamas will be released over the next 24 hours. White House officials are holding out hope two more Americans will be among those. Israel says they will continue to hold the truce as long as 10 hostages are released each day. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby says President Biden is playing an integral role in brokering the deal. Well, switching gears now, Kayla, a new report showing donations to the Republican National Committee dropping to an eight-year low. Is the RNC worried about this, especially as we head into an election year? Yeah, if they are, the leadership isn't saying so. The Washington Post says RNC has just a little more than $9 million in cash on hand. It's the lowest amount since former President Trump emerged as the leader of the GOP. Both large and small donors are giving less to the RNC over the recent years. Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel responding, saying people are donating directly to the candidates they support, adding, quote, there's nothing unusual about this because they know that once their candidate gets in, we'll merge and we'll be all working together to win the White House. This comes as Republicans have been calling on Ron and McDaniel to resign after a series of election losses since she took over in 2017. All right, Kayla Gaskins live from Capitol Hill. Thank you. Happening right now, a rescue mission in northern India after 41 miners were trapped after a collapse. Those workers have been there now for more than two weeks and rescuers still attempting and getting close 
to reaching them. Let's get right over to Tom Rogers in our live center. All eyes just glued to this right now, Tom. Yeah, that's right. Megan and Patrice, just about, <laughs> I, I'd say about a minute ago, you saw about three dozen crew members all in like uh, the same uniform with hard hats running down, <laughs> jogging, some even running down to the entrance of that tunnel. This is a live look here from India as we're talking about rescuers who have drilled through the rocks and debris to reach the 41 construction workers. At 9 o'clock this morning, just 12 minutes ago, they reported that they were inches away Away from breaking through the rubble by hand. The workers have been trapped in that collapsed tunnel in the Himalayas for the last 17 days. The workers are going to be pulled out through a passageway made out of welded pipes. Remember, this was supposed to take just a few days to dig them out, but it has turned into nearly three-week rescue. The complex operation stalled repeatedly due to the challenges of drilling through the rubble. Friday, rescuers resorted to manual digging after the drilling machine broke down the horizontal drill. Over the weekend, a drill that was still being used for horizontally going through through the rubble was damaged and the operation temporarily suspended again. Authorities have supplied those trapped workers with hot meals through the six inch pipe. They're currently about 650 feet from the entrance. Now the whole tunnel's three miles long, but they were able to make it all the way up to the collapse, which just happened around 650 feet from the entrance from where you are looking live right there. You can see they're starting to back up some ambulance. So this is a really good sign, which means hopefully at nine o'clock this morning, they were able to break through and they will start bringing uh, those miners that have been trapped there out. The original breakthrough is facing more issues, so they are actually, has another word, they are drilling down um, from the top coming down to them to see just in case there's some issues. No words yet on how they are doing physically and mentally. That's the latest from our live center, Patrice. All right, well, hopefully that's good news that with that ambulance there. We are cold and windy today. Look at this, that, that's, that's live. <laughs> some areas of the state seeing snow. Meteorologist Justin Chambers is tracking your frigid forecast coming up after the break. Americans charitable giving is the lowest it's been in three decades. But on this Giving Tuesday, find out how you can bring that number up. It is 914. You're watching Fox 45. Good day, Baltimore.
916 Americans are donating to charity at the lowest level in three decades. That's according to a recent report from Giving USA. Joining us this morning, shopping expert and brand strategist Trey Bott is joining us with how you can balance your charitable giving in time for today, Giving Tuesday. Good morning, Trey. Good morning. Thanks for having me. So let's talk about, first of all, why it's so low. Sure. So according to a Bread Financial poll, 33% of people are expecting to spend more this holiday season and 76% of people are looking for ways to save. What does that mean for Americans? It means that we're very, very concerned about our finances and we may not have that extra wiggle room in our budgets to give back to our favorite charities. So if you are planning to buy all the gifts that you want for your loved ones and your family, but you still have in the back of your mind, I do, I want to give um, to charities as well. How do you do that? What's the balance? So that's a great question. I, I think a very easy balance is a tool that just launched recently called Give Freely. This is a free browser extension that once you install it in your computer and you shop online, you'll be alerted to available coupons that you can click on to activate. So it's a great way to save on your purchases. However, at the same time, a portion of your purchase gets donated to your charity of choice at no cost to you. So this is a great way to balance saving and giving at the same time. I, I like that. That's a good idea. Is there a <laughs> particular percentage point that we should be trying to get to in terms of, of what we give or is that all very individual I would think? I think that's very individual actually and we have to be really honest with ourselves and what we can afford. If you're having a tough time right now financially, your charitable giving might fall by the wayside and that's okay. Thankfully, the Give Freely the Give Freely tool is a very helpful way to give back at no expense. But of course, if your financial situation improves a little, maybe you can donate five dollars a month to your favorite charity. Uh, there are other things that we can also do on Giving Tuesday. I'm seeing that a lot of brands and retailers are partnering with charities. So just by doing your holiday shopping, you can donate to causes that you care about. Uh, one that I really like is called World Vision, and this is a humanitarian organization that helps children in communities in need at times of disaster and poverty and they have a great gift catalog that's full of that's handcrafted awesome. gifts where you can give a gift and also a portion of that purchase is donated to an important cause so that's another way to give at the same time that's a perfect way to do it Trey always good advice from you thank you so much we appreciate it thanks so much all right, well, now will we appreciate these temperatures? Uh, we're going to find out. It, it depends on what side of the thermometer you like best. Meteorologist Justin Chambers with the, the dip we're seeing. Those people who love February and January around here are going to get in uh, for a treat today. It's a little preview, guys. Uh, all right, well, we'll take that shot. That's fine, but I wanted to take that a little bit later. Either way, that's this is what we're looking at right now uh, on I-68. That is uh, out near the West Virginia, Maryland line, where the sun is out right now. Uh, so that is definitely good news. We still have a winter weather advisory for Garrett County, which I'll show you a little bit more in just a little bit. Our Towson camera right now, the sun is out there. We did have a few flakes that were flying around our region this morning. We're actually up to 39 degrees, close to what we're expecting for the high the, for the day to be. Our northwest wind at 13 to 18 miles an hour putting that wind chill at 31. So that's the thing we'll have to focus on for the day today. And looking at our HD radar, there's not much to show right now. Even out in western Maryland, where we had some snow showers earlier. We even had a snow squall warning earlier. That area in purple in Garrett County under that winter weather advisory till 4 o'clock this afternoon. But things are improving there. Doesn't mean we're done. We still have the potential to see some more snow showers, especially coming north and west from Pittsburgh and right down into parts of the uh, Appalachians there from the north and west. And this is the cold front that's hanging out basically to our west right now. That's going to be crossing from west to east throughout the day today, and that's really going to pick up our wind speed. So as we get later into the afternoon, 20 and 30 mile an hour gusts will be pretty much commonplace for most of the day today. And then you factor in those temperatures in the 30s. It's going to feel like we're in the teens and 20s for most of your Tuesday afternoon. Tomorrow morning, colder temperatures, less wind, but that's still going to put those wind chill numbers in the significant uh, or potentially dangerous category because we'll have the single
single digit temperatures and well below uh, freezing for sure. All right, so your next 12 hours, yeah, not much improvement. Our temps in the upper 30s and sneaking into the lower 40s for some of us later into the afternoon, but overall, that doesn't do much to make you feel better. You're going to be outside. You got to make sure to bundle up. High temps only in the mid to upper 30s across Carroll and Baltimore counties for your highs today. Howard and Arundel counties also in the mid to upper 30s for your high temperatures. Typically, this time of year in the lower 50s, so nowhere near that number. Tomorrow, less wind, but we still have to deal with temperatures on the colder side in the 40s. But as early as Thursday, we'll ba we're back to the mid 50s. And notice we keep the mid and even upper 50s as we head into this upcoming weekend. Now, we do have another weather maker. Uh, okay, we have another weather maker coming in as we get into. <laughs> Hi, we have another weather maker coming in here on a Friday. That's going to be those rain showers that will be uh, here as well. But mid to upper 50s for our temperatures for the first weekend of December. So definitely more mild as we head into the weekend. We're keeping you on your toes, Justin. <laughs> the convenience of video conferencing, making work and school easier for many. But how could the tool be impacting your health? We're going to have that story just ahead. And we're getting ready for the Maryland Nutcracker. We're going to tell you how it's a little different. Edgar Allan Poe, maybe? Coming up next on Fox 45 Morning News, all local, all morning long. Fox 45 News, winner of 16 2022 Regional Emmy Awards, more than all other Baltimore news stations combined. A truly Maryland twist on a holiday classic. Mark Clark live at the ballet and body with how a certain Raven fanatic is making an appearance this holiday season. What's going on, Mark? That's right, guys. So Melissa's been dancing all morning. This is her other face. And <laughs> so great to see you. So Melissa, you guys incorporate a lot of cool things into the Maryland Nutcracker, including Edgar Allan Poe. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, you will see Edgar Allan Poe. So with the traditional Nutcracker, you're probably used to seeing a quirky Uncle Drosselmeyer bringing in his dolls. And here at Ballet and Body's production of the Maryland Nutcracker, we feature Edgar Allan Poe as that quirky uncle, bringing in his dolls, his characters, the Raven, Annabelle Lee, Mask of the Red Dead. 
death might make an appearance. Wow. Um, and just an homage to, you know, Baltimore's favorite poet, Edgar Allan Poe. I mean, so many great ideas with a, already, it's already a classic. And then you incorporate all the cool things that tap into Maryland. I think it's a great idea. Once again, when does it start? When can we get tickets? How does this thing go? Absolutely. So we open on December 9th and 10th at Carroll Community College. We are Carroll County's professional ballet company. You can head to the Maryland Nutcracker.com to get tickets right now. Awesome. Again, who knew Ed could dance? Look at him. <laughs> He's graceful. Who knew? Beautiful. <laughs> Looks good. All right, Mark, thank you. If you want more information, go to foxbaltimore.com slash newslinks. Well, it is cold and it is windy today. Perfect, not perfect, for a polar dunk Yay! after the break. Meteorologist Justin Chambers is telling you just how cold it's going to be and where we're going to get snow and who's bringing me hot chocolate later today. <laughs> The man who murdered a well-known Little Italy, Italy restaurant manager sentenced and convicted. We'll give you the update just ahead here. Fox 35 Morning News. Good day, Baltimore. Live from WBFF in Baltimore, this is Fox 45 Good Day Baltimore. Welcome back on this Tuesday, 9.30 is the time. I'm Patrice Sanders. I'm Megan Gilland. How many hours till you get dunked? <laughs> Hopefully you get dunked is what we're hoping for. That means that your charity did well. So don't give. No, I'm just kidding. Uh. Give, <laughs> give all That's the That's the message money. on this Giving Tuesday. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm ready to do it. It is the uh, Carroll County Boys and Girls Club, Westminster Boys and Girls Club. So I'm, I'm all for it. And it's going to be a lot of fun. And not only do I get dunked, but I have to dress up to get dunked. And I have theme music to come out oh to. Oh, my gosh. We got to come. I can't tell in. everybody what I'm dressing well, up Well, what time is it? Uh, the event is from three to five. Okay. My part will be closer to to the end to see oh, if they actually. Oh, good. When it's by. colder, yeah, that'll be that'll <laughs> right. be perfect for you. And yeah. dark. Yeah, she's gonna. Oh, you're gonna yeah, come out of there with dark. icicles, man. You're gonna have a a Patrice icicle <laughs> sandwich drink. I can't. All right. Well, continue. All right. Let's roll on. You know those ice cubes that you get like. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's go outside, shall we? <laughs> 
Help me. Uh, our Toyota Inner Harbor Skycam, we got some clouds hanging around right now. Uh, overall, though, the wind is what we're talking about. And look at those cold temperatures. We're at 18 degrees in Oakland, 29 in Cumberland, 31 Hagerstown. Most of us are hanging out in the mid to upper 30s. Those temps are not bad, but again, you factor in that wind and it feels quite a bit colder as we head into the day today. So more of that wind will be with us here as you head out the door. Definitely grab a jacket, have the sunglasses ready to go too, because we'll have plenty of sunshine, but it's the wind we really have to worry about today. Only about 40 today, 42 tomorrow. So less wind. And then we're right back to the mid fifties as early as Thursday. Back with your full forecast. We'll do that. Talk about what we can expect for the first weekend of December coming up in a few. Patrice. All right. Sounds good. Looking at our Lynn Stoller traffic now. Network, and we are tracking an accident on Maryland 100. Uh, it's, this, it's stop and go there. Uh, not known how many vehicles are involved, but you can see the slowdown there on the screen. So uh, avoid that area if you can or give yourself plenty of extra time. New data released from the Baltimore Police Department shows 15 young people have been arrested for various crimes in the past five days across nearly half of the city's police districts. Police arrested seven juveniles for car theft in the Northern District. This was on Sunday, the youngest 12 years old. Police say one of the 15 year old suspects had been arrested eight times. In the Southern District on Friday, two 15 year olds and a 14 year old arrested for holding a man at gunpoint and demanding his keys. That is according to the Baltimore Police Department. Officers arrested the teens in a stolen car, saying one of those teens had already been arrested three times on stolen car charges. BPD tells us that four teenagers robbed a man and assaulted him at gunpoint near Patterson Park last Wednesday in the Southeast District. All four were arrested. And in the Eastern District that same day, Foxtrot tracked down two teenagers who stole a car. Police say they then recovered drugs and a stolen gun when they arrested the suspects. Many juveniles also accused of taking part in the car theft crisis, as we've been saying, and Baltimore has now surpassed 10,000 auto thefts this year. Police say juveniles stole 38% of those cars. Fox 45 News spoke with one man who had a lock on his steering wheel, but his car was still stolen for a second time over the weekend. I'm the victim, but I'm being treated like the, the villain. I mean, these guys go around stealing these cars each and every day, tearing people's cars up, and we got to dig in our pockets for something that they done destructed. Right. It's not right. right. And the city needs to do something. Well, BPD sent a statement saying in part, they are working to address the surge in auto thefts and that they've seen a 21% reduction in auto thefts in the last 28 days. Baltimore Police data reports 10.3 thousand auto thefts and attempted auto thefts so far for the year. Mayor Brandon Scott is addressing the auto theft, saying that his administration is wholeheartedly committed to solving the issue. The mayor says as police arrest the same individuals for the same crimes, it is time for other parts of the justice system to do their part. Mayor Scott has called for a complete overhaul of the Department of Juvenile Services before, but hasn't offered specifics about the changes that he would like to see. Elsewhere in a city in crisis, nearly two years after a popular Little Italy restaurant manager, Chesley Patterson, was shot dead, the man who admitted to murdering him receives his sentence. Taylor Stewart joins us live with more on what Samuel Wise is now facing. Taylor. Uh, that is right, Patrice. Samuel Wise will be behind bars for 50 years, followed by three years of probation. That is the sentence a judge just handed down this week. You'll recall this case, Chesley Patterson, a well-known restaurant manager in Little Italy. He worked at La Scala, not far from that place, when he was attacked and his life was taken by Wise. Now, back in January of 2022, you can see him in this video at his car, right on the Eastern Avenue block nearby that restaurant. What we can tell you is that when that van pulls up, Wise gets out, he shoots him in the chest, and that is the testimony the judge and the, witness, and the jury heard this past week. Take a listen to how people are reacting. It was someone that uh, everyone liked, and uh, it was sad to hear of the situation. He pleaded guilty. That's great. I'm happy to hear that because he has to pay for what he has done. 
Now, certainly bringing some closure, hopefully, to folks who love this restaurant, love this community, and say Patterson is not gone. He will forever be remembered. The anniversary of this murder is in January of 2022. We will, of course, continue to follow it. Back to you guys. juvenile crime hearing ahead of the upcoming legislative session. We have Shannon Lilly joining us live from BPD headquarters with a look at some recent examples of juveniles accused of committing crime. Shannon. Yeah, this morning, Megan, we're taking a look at some of the latest data from Baltimore police, and it shows us that 15 juveniles have been arrested for various reasons around the city since Wednesday. And for some of those juveniles, this is not their first arrest or even their second. The victim is claiming that the four juveniles, um, high schoolers, dressing all black, uh, went towards the park. They utilized a handgun. You're listening to Dispatch on the eve of Thanksgiving as police were called to Baltimore's Patterson Park after a victim says they were robbed at gunpoint by a group of juveniles. Well, just days later, a rash of armed robberies hit the Pigtown area. The majority of the suspects were told in that case, also juveniles. If BPD says, well, we're arresting them, and you see that, you know, on the report that, you know, that they're, or at least they were in custody and they were taken downtown, so you know that. Uh, DJS says that, you know, we're giving them services and look at our chart and here's how great this is working. But yet down here, you know, there's, a lot of instances with our own eyes, with our cameras, with whatever you know we use, whatever evidence, it seems like there are kids slipping through those cracks. And speaking of that, there have been more than 10,000 car thefts reported in Baltimore so far this year. Last week, BPD revealed about 38% of these thefts were committed by juveniles. Now, the breakdown is even more concerning, with about two-thirds of those suspects reported to the Department of Juvenile Services, but only 5% serving time in a DJS facility. In one of the most recent cases police are telling us about, they say they arrested seven juveniles for auto thefts, but one of those juveniles had already been arrested eight times. Reporting live from police headquarters, I'm Shannon Lilly, Fox 45 News. Good day, Baltimore. Thank you, Shannon. Coming up, the funeral of former First Lady Rosalind Carter. Those in attendance and the tributes from other former presidents and First Ladies coming up after the break. It's a cold one today and some parts of Maryland are even getting snow. Meteorologist Justin Chambers will have more on the winter weather and what to expect this week. 939, you're watching Fox 45. Good day, Baltimore.
942, two days of funeral services are about to begin in Georgia, honoring the life and legacy of former First Lady Rosalind Carter. We have Tom Rogers in our live center with the arrangements underway. Tom. Yeah, we're watching the president of Marine One. They're going to be going over to Air Force One here at the uh, Air Andrews Base, Air Force Base. Um, so there, you just see the back of them walking there. They're getting ready to go to Georgia. And this morning, that's where the first funeral service will begin this afternoon. Despite being in hospice care since February, former President Jimmy Carter is expected to attend. 99-year-old President Carter expected to lead President Biden and First Lady Jill Biden as they're getting on Air Force One there. Longtime friends of Carter's, along with Vice President Kamala Harris, President Bill Clinton, plus all the living former First Lady, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, Melania Trump, Michelle Obama, and Laura Bush. Now, Presidents Donald Trump, Barack Obama, and George Bush were invited, but they will not be attending. These tributes starting yesterday, where hundreds turned out to salute Rosalind Carter for her final journey from Plains, Georgia, to the Jimmy Carter Presidential Center. Today's service will be filled with classic hymns and her favorite Bible passages. Her private burial is set for tomorrow in the Carter's hometown of Plains, as she will be remembered for her determination to help people, especially American caregivers, and for her advocacy, though, for better mental health treatment. Again, you just watched the presidents getting on Air Force One here. Rosalind Carter was 96 years last week. They just took that down. Let me see if I can show you something else, though, too, because we I know they had a, uh, a shot from this. Yeah, I want to update you also because the uh, tunnel in India that collapsed on those 41 workers, we've seen multiple ambulance go back, and it looks like they're loading people on and then leave. So that's the update on this tunnel. Ooh. 17 days that they've been trying to rescue those workers who were trapped about 650 feet down in that three-mile tunnel. They've got them out, and uh, it's starting to pull out more ambulance and go out there. So hopefully that will continue without issue. That's the latest from our uh, live center. Patrice. All right. That'd be great news, Tom. Coming up, have you heard the word of the year? After the break, Merriam-Webster's word of the year. Any guesses? Drinks. No. Because that's what's on our minds here this morning as we prepare to learn about all the festive brews and more that will make your holiday party a hit. Maybe Kane? Not. Not, Not it. 944. <laughs> You're watching Good Day Baltimore. Fox 45. Not it, <laughs> not it.
All right, everybody, 947 is your time. Whether you have a holiday party coming up or just want some festive drinks to have around the house, here's a way to add in some holiday to your cocktails this season. With us this morning, mixologist and co-founder of the Kane Collective, Aaron Joseph, along with event planner, Mikey Monahan. Let's talk about drinks. Good morning and happy <laughs> holidays to both of you. Good morning. Happy to holidays you. to you. Like, I'm kind of in the middle. I'm bebopping yes. around here. You're going to make <laughs> some <laughs> drinks for us in a second. Mikey, talk about what's going on with this great event you guys have. Yes, you got it. We have the Maker's Market a week from this Saturday. Yeah. Um, it's our ninth annual event, and it's basically it's like uh, shopping local on steroids is how I, <laughs> how I refer to it. So basically what happens is Greenspring Station, home to the most locally owned businesses in Baltimore, right. we bring in another 25 to 30 makers from around the region, set shop around the center and basically you have a festive day with live music, new artisan um, gift ideas, uh, cocktails made by the <laughs> artist himself, right. Aaron, and it's just a great festive day to come out. Now talk about uh, Bryant Park, a lot of people yep. you know, think about that in New York City if they know what that is, but yes. it's kind of modeled after that, is that right? Yes, I went to Bryant Park years ago, I actually lived in New York City and yeah. loved that market and said, you know what, Baltimore needs it, and um, doing the marketing for Greenspring Station, we brought it there. That's great, okay, it's December 9th is the date for that. Yeah. All right, let's talk about why you're here, Kane Collective, <laughs> sir. Now, what is this holiday drink you're going to make for us today? So today we're going to be making a cocktail called the Jolly Cha Toddy. Um, Jolly Toddy. Yeah, All right. diversity. Normally, I would say we're serving it cold, but yeah. thanks to your weather report today, I think this should be warm. <laughs> but we're going to act like it's sunny and bright outside. Right. Okay, I like so that. We're going to serve like it cold that. as okay, well. Okay, good, good, good. What we already have in the mixer tin is our okay. aged rum from Papa's Pilar. Oh, nice. And then we have our chai toddy that we make here in Baltimore, yeah. uh, which is going to have local chai tea, lemon juice, and a Roasted I've seen your sign. I've seen King Collective. So that's Thank a local business. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, very good. Very okay. local. All right, so mix it up. Yep. Obviously. Added, added, added ice. Give it up. He's a master. He's a master. There you go. That's, a, that's <laughs> aggressive. I'm so, <laughs> that is so, aggressive. so, so, so yeah. sorry, but you gotta wake up. No, man. that's good. That's and good. We'll strain it right over some ice. Okay. Like so. I love that. Gorgeous, and gorgeous. And uh, garnish it with a little bit of fresh grated cinnamon. Okay, so a grated cinnamon. Yes. I never thought about that because you think about just putting the uh, the cinnamon in there, but you got to grate it, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm. It's five o'clock somewhere here, yeah. right? And so we have that cocktail as well as the three cocktails he is here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you want some? He's hydrating. He's hydrating on it. Hydrating, right? Yeah, so yes. we have our cranberry mimosa. We'll also be having our cider sour and then our spiced pear mule. Okay. Great in, great info. Real quick, real yeah. where, where can people get more info for Maker's Market December 9th? You got it. Greenspringstation.com. Easy. All right. Thank you both for being here. And uh, please leave the drinks because we got other people in the studio. <laughs> Stay hydrated. Right. Yes. Back to you guys. Cheers. Listen, thanks for looking out for us. Get this. A new study found that so-called Zoom fatigue is real. And it may actually take a toll on the brain and the heart. In the very small study, there were 35 students who attended lectures at a university in Austria. Half attended a video lecture one week and attended in person the next week. Researchers tracked electrical activity of participants' brains and hearts, as well as fatigue and mood levels. Participants reported feeling drowsy and fed up while they were in the video conference, and the brain and the heart activity backed that up. Researchers say the study shows the physical toll of video conferencing. The findings suggest that it should be a complement to face-to-face -face interaction, not a substitute. I could see that. You get so much energy from other yes. humans in person. And you get drinks if you yeah, come to the studio. <laughs> that's everything. All right, Merriam-Webster released its 2023 word of the year. I wasn't sure about why they chose this, but then I read some more. This year's word is authentic. I'm still not sure. I might need your, your backing, which you find. The term had a high volume lookup mm -hmm. in most recent years, but saw a substantial increase in 2023. They say it is driven by artificial intelligence, celebrity culture, identity, social media, I guess. So authentic, they're saying to you, see people, what's yeah, real. People, you want to know, am I being my authentic self? Is right. this authentic cuisine? Did, did this person authentically write this speech that they're saying now that there's like, so it. there was a lot of that. Huh. So I, I get it. You ready for the runners up here? The words include Riz. And so I thought of uh, Ralph Tresvant from New Edition, <laughs> but <laughs> wasn't it? Nope, nope. Then you got deep fake, implode, and indict. 2022's word of the year for your member was gaslighting. Right. And Riz means charisma. You've got charisma. I like that. So tossing to someone now yes. with a lot of Riz. Dr. Riz, meteorologist <laughs> Justin Chambers. Morning. Oh, and he's still got a drink. Oh, good, my God. Good I didn't even see yeah. that. There you go.
Oh, wow. I mean, that's authentic right there. <laughs> wow. It's a jolly toddy. <laughs> that is quite jolly, sir. Thank you very much. Quite jolly. December 9th. All right, Makers, <laughs> makers Market. I'm all, I'm all real, man. I mean, I, I have to clip my eyebrows, my eyebrow hairs, and I have to shave the middle because they're, they're poking out right there. And I got to take a little thing and I got to do that or pluck them out if I have to. That's real, man. That's authentic. You're not going to hear that anywhere else. You're not going to hear that anywhere else. So I thought you guys meant Riz from, from Greece, you know, like Rizzo. Yeah. All right, uh, 39 degrees, Sandra D, uh, west to northwest wind, about 13 to 15 miles an hour. Our dew point at 19 degrees. Dry air is in place. Wind chill at 31 degrees. The big thing today is going to be that wind chill. We're starting to get a few more clouds rolling in from the west on our HD radar. So don't be surprised if we're going to see a few flakes flying around here, even throughout the next couple of hours right here in Baltimore. The winter weather advisory continues for Garrett County here all the way until 4 o'clock this afternoon. And that is because this cold front bringing in a little bit of moisture. It's called the upslope flow that comes up the backside of the Appalachians, which is why we're seeing a lot of that snow develop. And again, still a little leftover moisture for us. Also bringing in the wind will bring some of that snow from west to east. So 20 to 30 mile an hour winds today, making those wind chill numbers in the teens and 20s. So we'll get to 40 today. Less wind tomorrow, back to the lower 40s on Wednesday but then mid-50s return as early as Thursday and Friday. We're back with your 10-day forecast. There is nothing fake about that, y'all.